Okay, so welcome everyone to the 74th lecture of Dr. Hyde Step 1 and uh, the fifth lecture of microbiology for this week. Uh, <clears throat> before I begin, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear my voice. If you guys can, can I get a yes on the chat box, please? Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for making it to today's lecture. Um, we apologize for starting the lecture at 930. Um, but hopefully it will not hamper our uh, study schedule for today. Our goal is to finish and make a dent in virology as much as possible and to make sure that we can finish off microbiology by taking away bacteriology, parasitology, mycology, and virology at last today so that it gives you guys enough uh, knowledge and confidence to solve the microbiology questions from you all. So that's what we are going to do. And hopefully by the end of the lecture today, after finishing biology, we will also be doing um, some questions from you world uh, offline, like how we usually used to do last week. That's what we are going to do. Since we have the knowledge now we can do the questions. That's what we are going to do. Before I do that, uh, before we begin the discussion from first date, I just want to make sure that you guys did your homework were you guys able to complete your homework from yesterday? Yes or no? Were you guys able to read parasites from first aid, like how we discussed that you would do for this week? Okay. So how about before we begin virology, we do a quick revision of first day uh, of parasites to see where we stand in order to for me to assess whether you guys have done your homeworks properly or not. Yes or no? Okay, perfect. So let's begin with the review and recapitulation of yesterday's lecture and see where we stand. First and foremost, if we have to talk about parasites, we can divide them by talking about parasites in terms of endoparasites and ectoparasites. Endoparasites can be classified into protozoal, nematodes, cystodes, and trematodes, and ectoparasites are scabies and thyrus pubis, which we studied yesterday. Now, let's talk about protozoa at first. First of all, let's talk about the protozoas in the GI system. How many protozoas are there and what are they? three protozoas, three protozoas, and what are they? What are the names of the three protozoal, GI protozoal organisms? Giardia, ant, amoeba, and cryptosporidium. Cryptosporidium, very good. Next one is, um, out of all three of them, which one is more common in AIDS patient? Cryptosporidium, very good. Okay, if you have to diagnose Giardia, what do you expect to see? Cysts or oocysts or trophozoids or what do you expect to see? Uh, unfortunately, that is not correct. Cyst is the form of transmission and what we expect to see is trophozoid, okay? So that was a tricky question and you guys fell right into it, <clears throat> okay? Okay, so next one. Next one is, if you have to diagnose cryptosporidium, what are you expected to see? Okay, good. Next one. Next one is, um, if you have a patient with multiple ring enhancing lesions in the brain who has a pet cat, what is the diagnosis? How will you diagnose toxoplasmosis from serum or blood or any other discharge? Tachyzoids. Okay, very good, tachyzoids. Can you guys tell me the triad of congenital toxoplasmosis? What are the triad symptoms of congenital toxoplasmosis? Hydrocephalus, calcifications, chorioretinitis. Very good. Okay. Trypanosoma brutzi. What does Trypanosoma brutzi cause? What is the name of the disease? 
African sleeping sickness. Very good. Okay. What is the mo which bug is responsible for transmitting Craptanosoma bootsy? Seed C fly. Very good. Okay. Uh, so far, so good. You guys are giving absolutely amazing answers. So thank you so much. Next one is if you have a patient with malaria who goes to a malaria. I mean, you have a patient who does not have malaria, but who wishes to go to a malaria endemic zone and is asking you how long should he continue the um, drug that is methloquin after he comes back. Four weeks. Okay, good. How are, how are you supposed to diagnose malaria in the blood? How does, how will you diagnose malaria? Smear. <clears throat> okay, the blood smear. And then what are you expected to see? Ring forms. Okay. If you see Maltese cross patterns, what is the diagnosis? Babesia. Okay. You have another patient who has difficulty in deglutition along with uh, heart failure and who recently had a history of being bitten by a bug. This is Chagas disease. You have another patient who have fever, hepatospinomegaly, and pancytopenia. What are you expected to see if I tell you that there was a history of sand fly bite? How will you diagnose this patient? <coughs> Macro... <coughs> Macrophage containing A masticles. <clears throat> Macrophage containing A masticles. Okay. Next one. Next one is um, how many types? What are the names? Okay. I'm not going to ask you the names. Okay. Let me rephrase the question. Um, if you have a patient who has a history of anal pruritus, what is the possible diagnosis of the parasite? Vermicularis, very good. How about muscle pain? Muscle pain, spiralis. Next one is biliary obstruction. Ascariasis, lumbricoides, very good, okay. Uh, larval, larval penetration to the skin and um, causing microcytic anemia. Strongyloid sarcolaris will not cause that amount of microcytic anemia as ankylostoma will. So the answer is ankylostomiosis or nectar americanus. Okay. Uh, how about rectal, rectal prolapse? Rectal prolapse in young children. Okay, how about blindness? Black sight, black fly. Okay, how about worm and conjunctiva? Okay, elephantasis. Okay, good. How about um, the treatment of all of most of the nematodes? What is the treatment of most of the nematodes? <clears throat> Bendazoles, very good. What is the treatment of most of the cystodes? Okay. Um, you have a trematode with a lateral spine. Which trematode is this? Okay. You have a trematode with a terminal spine. Which uh, trematode is this? Very good. You have a trematode which is responsible for causing cholangiocarcinoma. Which trematode is this? <clears throat> okay, you have a patient who comes to you with intense pruritus at night, interdigital burrows and clefts. What is the diagnosis? Okay. 
Last one is you have a patient who comes to you with Intel's scalp pruritus along with axillary pruritus. <clears throat> Very good. Okay. So that's about all. So um, hopefully you guys will not have any trouble when you guys solve your UVL question. You guys can easily diagnose the parasite they are trying to do describe from um, the question stem. So in terms of confidence before the lecture and confidence after the lecture, is there a, is there a big difference? Is, do we have increased confidence from um, everyone be, when, when compared to before the lecture and after the lecture? Okay. That is very good to know. So thank you so much because not only um, are you guys confident that you guys have learned parasites, we ourselves are confident that we have helped you um, understand parasites too. So thank you so much. Okay, so with that being said, are we ready to finish the week with a bang and get done with virology? Okay, perfect. So let me share the screen and let's begin without wasting any more time. Okay, so it's 9.45 as of right now. We are going to begin with virology. Okay, first and foremost, if you guys can see my screen, can I get a yes on the chat box? Okay, do we have any new students with us today? Um, we have a student with the name of Zoom user. Would you um, identify yourself with your name or email address? <clears throat> Zoom user. Hello? Yes, sir. What is your name and what is, what's your email address? Who do I have the, um, who am I speaking to? Dr. Zoom user, um, would you identify yourself before we begin the lecture? Hi, my name is Quams. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just joining. I just um, finished an exam, so I'm just I'm watching from my phone. Oh, perfect. Okay, so uh, is this a, is this the first class for you today? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, would you happen to have sent us an email with the help of uh, with the name of Medic Medical? Yes, that's me. Okay, perfect. So thank you so much for joining today's lecture. Hope you enjoy the lecture with us today. If you have any questions, you can use the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Um, and uh, cur currently we are finishing microbiology. We are done with bacteria, parasites, fungi. And uh, from today, we are going to finish virology and um, that's that. This is the last lecture for the week. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, uh, please send us an email to uh, continue with us further in the future from next week. Okay, so with that being said, thank you so much for letting me know. Uh, and uh, let's begin. Is everyone ready once again? Use the chat box to give the answer. Is everyone ready to begin virology? Okay, Thank perfect. you. You are absolutely welcome. Okay. Okay, listen, let's begin with virology. So before we jump into virology, first of all, I just want to let you guys know that virology is the first three or four pages of virology is extremely, extremely important. The reason being is because if you can master the first three or four pages, you do not even have to study in depth of all the viruses because most of the questions in USMLE step one will have the question stem where they will try to uh, describe the virus to you in terms of strandness, whether if it's a single strand or a double strand, whether if it's a DNA or an RNA, or whether it's um, when, whether it as an equal, whether it's a double uh, capsid or a single capsid, and so that's what we are going to do from the first uh, three or four days, where 
I mean, for the first three, uh, for the first hour or so, that's what we're going to do is that we're going to master whether uh, we are uh, sure that we know all these informations or not. So <clears throat> right before we jump into virology, I just want to talk about the structure of the, vi of the of viruses in general. Viruses in general, you guys can hear my voice correct perfectly. Is, is that so? Can, can you guys hear my voice? Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay. So viruses in general, they have a nucleic acid. Okay. So viruses in general, they have a nucleic acid. And what they have is they have, an, they have a capsid. This is a very simple structure of a virus. So this is basically how a naked, <clears throat> this is basically how a naked virus would look like. <clears throat> By naked virus, what we mean is a virus lacking an envelope. <clears throat> so a naked virus with an eicosahedral, this is an eicosahedral capsid. This is what an eicosahedral capsid looks like. Next one is if you want to provide an envelope for the virus, the envelope for the virus would, act, would be this round structure that is surrounding the virus that helps the virus survive a more extreme condition. And when a virus has an envelope, the envelopes have these sorts of antigenic surface proteins. These surface protein, if the virus is enveloped, this allows the immune system to identify the viruses faster because these surface proteins are peptide components like how we talked about in the immune system that the more peptide component an organism have, the better the immune response. Do we remember that? Do we remember that one? Yes or no? <clears throat> Based on that, we give our booster doses or vaccines. Do you guys remember that? That we talked about the peptide component of the immune of the immune system. So that's that. Next, next one is this is as simple as any structure can get. Another one is the nucleic acid over here. The nucleic acid over here. This is surrounded by either an eicosahedral capsid, or if we were to if we were to discard the eicosahedral capsid, then there's another form of capsid by which the virus usually presents. You have the nucleic acid, you have the envelope, you have the surface protein, and the capsid is actually a helical capsid, something like this, like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a helix, like a DNA helix, okay? So that's how it basically is. So this is how viruses would present. Uh, the virus that we are very concerned about nowadays is coronavirus. If I have to ask you that why coronavirus is, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, escaping your immune system so fast, then can we assume that there is a pot that the coronavirus is a naked virus? Yes or no? Is coronavirus a naked virus? If it's escaping your immune system? Okay. So. That, that being said, that basically means that it does not have a proper envelope and uh, the surface proteins that are there, they are not being, um, they are not there and that's why they cannot mount a proper immune response. So that's that. So this is, this is what basically a virus basically is. So we have this structure of the virus, then we have another structure of the virus. This is basically the virus we talked about in bacterial genetics. Okay. Okay, this bacterial genetic that we talked about is a bacteriophage. Okay, this is a bacteriophage. Okay, the bacteriophages they have a nucleic acid capsule, they have collars, spikes, and the basically the structure of bacteriophage for the for the purpose of learning clinical virology is not that high yield, but that's that. Okay. So um, that being said, with that being said, we are going to jump into the second one. Are we all sure? Are we all, um, have we all understood the structure of the viruses? Yes or no? Okay, good. So with that being said, we are going to um, jump into viral genetics, okay? Viral, viral genetics, there are some uh, high yield things that we have to understand. First of all, uh, the viral genetics talks about four types Four, four terms. The terms are basically viral recombination, viral reassortment, viral complementation, and viral phenotype mixing. Okay, so number one is um, okay. So so number one that we want the number one thing that we want to discuss with you is recombination. What is viral recombination? Okay, recombination. How are the questions going to come, and uh, what's going to happen over here? Okay, so viral recombination, okay. This is basically 
this is basically if you have two viruses over here focus on the word combination okay recombination so if if you have two viruses with their two nucleic acid okay and over here you have you have some amount of proteins and on, on the capsid that is the capsid protein and you have this capsid protein over here okay if if these two viruses if these two viruses come close to each other and they exchange their genetic material by crossing over by only crossing over so they can have this sort of a new presentation <clears throat> where the nucleic acid would look something like this the nucleic acid would look something like this and they will have they would have this sort of a surface protein so recombination is actually a very simple process of viral um, of viral genetics basically the whole reason why viral recombination and all of this viral genetics is important for us to learn is so that we have an idea about how um, there is uh, changes in the structure of the virus which can escape an immune system and um, that way we can make our uh, vaccines and we can boost up our immune systems accordingly so that's the reason so basically if you were to make an a vaccine against this virus and you were to make a vaccine against this virus but you had no knowledge that these two viruses would come close together and form this new virus so you might have cured the patient of this one and this one but this new one over here is now causing the disease so uh, you don't have a vaccine against this one now this is the one in concern so that's the reason why learning viral genetics is so important so let's focus on recombination once again as we have just seen that recombination is nothing but just exchange of genes between the chromosomes uh, by what they do is that they cross over with the regions, they cross over with regions of significant base sequence homology. The fact that there, there is significant base um, positions of these surface proteins, they will cross over like this only cross over at the significant point. Th this is not um, what we would say is random. This is not a random change. So in order for these two things to happen, these viruses, they have to, uh, they ha they have to come in close contact and then there will be viral recombination. So that's the first one. So the questions are basically going to come is that they, they will have in a question stem, they will basically tell you that there is a process of genetic exchange between viruses um, between two viruses and there's a production of a new virus. So if, if it's a very simple type of genetic exchange with no other thing involved, then the term in concern is recombination. So the questions are going to come from over here. The answers are over here as usual. Next one. Next one is viral reassortment. Viral reassortment, if we have to talk about reassortment of the viruses. <clears throat> as, we have, as we have discussed previously in our UWorld notes, we we mentioned how viral reassortment is only possible for segmented virus, yes or no? Yes or no? Segmented, segmented virus. For this one, the only thing you have to know, reassortment, viral reassortment, is viral reassortment is the viral, is that the virus uh, rearranges itself when it comes in close contact to another segmented virus. Segmented viruses, for example, we have rotas, we have influenza virus, right? So what happens is you have, um, you have, for example, this virus in concern, I'm gonna refrain from not drawing anymore because to, in order to save time, to, I'm gonna use the drawings over here. As you can see over here that, that this virus comes in close contact with this one, this is a segmented virus and they, re they rearrange themselves. Both of them, as a matter of fact, are, are segmented as you can see over here, right? The both, the both of them, they rearrange themselves to have genetic materials from each and every one. So instead of recombining or combining the two chromosomes, they rearrange to have both chromosomes together. This is known as viral reassortment. So the thing to focus on, the things the, that you need to see from recombination and reassortment is over here is that the chromosome is actually singular with, with the combination of two chromosomes from two viruses. This is basically a double chromosome with 
uh, with one chromosome from one and another chromosome from another virus. And at the same time, they're also exchanging their CAPC protein. So this is basically the viruses. When viruses with, se with segmented genome, they exchange, the genetic gen they exchange the genetic material. This is known as viral reassortment. The word to focus on over here is segmented genomes. Segmented genomes is influenza virus. So that's that. Okay. So uh, the reason why reassortments are very high yield is because pandemics can happen because of viral reassortment. So the pandemic that we are going through right now has a possibility uh, if we if we completely discard the fact that coronavirus is a bioweapon, then we can assume that the pandemic has happened because of viral reassortment of genes from human, swine, and avian viruses. Basically, if there is um, if the coronavirus have emerged, for example, a lot of people say that bats were involved, then when it came in close contact with the coronavirus in the humans, and both of them are segmented, then it rearranged, then it rearranged itself to form have to form a new virus, that is the SARS-CoV-2. That's a comparatively new strain. And right now, as a matter of fact, now since they are trying to prevent this one, apparently there is another new strain. So there's a possibility that reassortment is happening. And you have to understand that you have to, you have to understand that um, the viruses um, over here is coming from three, three, uh, two or three more different types of um, species, right? So you have one virus from human, another one from swine, another one from avian, for example. So the, that's, that's that, okay? Okay, so once again, the questions are going to come when we're, they will talk about segmented virus and what type of genetic material will be exchanged. Whenever you hear the word segmented virus, um, just close your eyes and choose reassortment and hopefully it will be the right answer. Okay, next one is complementation. Have you guys understood reassortment? Okay. 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 Um, you guys can hear my voice, am I correct? Okay, perfect. Next one. Next one is complementation. Okay, let's talk about complementation. Complementation is basically uh, this one over here, okay, complementation. Okay. Complementation is basically when you have one virus, okay, when you have one virus that is functional, okay, for example, you have one functional virus and you have, this is functional, and you have another virus that is non-functional, okay. If the non-functional virus comes in close contact to the functional virus. The functional virus will complement the non-functional virus to come up with a new strain. This is known as complementation. So the easiest way to identify the term complementation is that if you have one functional virus, another non-functional virus comes in close contact with this, this will result in a new strain that is functional. So who is being, who is being, be, who, who has the benefit, functional or non-functional? Fast answers, please. So non-functional, good. So the non-functional virus is being benefited over here. So what happens is when one of the two viruses that infect the cell has a mutation that results in a non-functional protein, the non-mutated virus complements the mutated one by making a functional protein that serves both virus. For example, the one of the best example for this is hepatitis D and hepatitis B. Can hepatitis D function without being infected without the patient being infected with hepatitis B? No, right? So in order for hepatitis D to perform or to infect properly, we need we need hepatitis B to go and attack the patient first. So that's that. So this is known as complementation. Next one. Next one is phenotype mixing. Okay, uh, before we move on to phenotype mixing, the thing, the things to look out for in your question is you have to identify one functional, one non-functional. If they talk about uh, one non-functional virus later being, for example, most of the questions about these ones will be research associated. That is, they will tell you that you have a research assistant who is doing this, who is doing that. 
for example, you have a research assistant who is fun who is working on a non-functional virus, and uh, when the virus came in close contact with another functional virus, there was a new strain. Which sort of uh, genetic um, processes this? The answer is complementation. So that's that. Look out for the word functional and non-functional for this one. Okay, so I'm just going to highlight this over here so that you can highlight it too, so that it's better for you in the future for a quick revision. Okay, next one. Next one is phenotype mixing. Okay, phenotype mixing. Okay. Phenotype mixing, as you can basically see, is that you have um, you have two viruses. You have virus A and virus B over here. Obviously, there are, there are some changes in uh, the structure resulting in two progenies of the virus, that is progeny one and kind of progeny two. So what happened is over here, this will occur with simultaneous infection of a cell with two viruses. So first of all, the cell will get infected with both of these viruses together and, and for, pro for progeny one, the genome of virus A can be partially or completely coated. So with the surface proteins of virus B. So when, when they get um, infected together with the virus A and virus B together, the genetic material is that of virus A, but there is only change in the surface protein. And the type B protein code determines the tropism of the infectivity of the hybrid virus. The progeny from subsequent infection of a cell by progeny one will have a type A code that is encoded by its type A genetic material. This sounds extremely complex, <clears throat> but I'm, I'm just going to break it down over here. That phenotype mixing is absolutely nothing but the fact that there has been a change in the surface protein. So first of all, you are going to mount an immune response against the surface protein of virus A or virus B but what happens is when they mix together, the genetic material is that of virus A, but the surface protein is now is that of virus B. So in order for you to identify the questions, first of all, you have to look out for, do uh, you, you have to look out for the fact that there has to be mentions of two viruses in your question stem. If there are mentions of two viruses in your question stem and they say one is functional, another one is non-functional, then immediately you choose complementation. If there is mentions of two viruses in your question stem and they tell you that you uh, that uh, <clears throat> that there's a that your immune system cannot mount an immune response anymore. Okay, if they talk about failing immune system when both of viruses affected together, then they are talking about phenotype mixing. The, the reason being is because you will always mount an immune response against the surface protein of the capsid over here, but since the capsid protein is now being changed and there's a new progeny virus with the previous genetic material that is the same of virus A, but now has the surface protein of virus B. This is a new virus. So you cannot mount an immune response against this. It will take some time again. So in the meantime, you will get affected and there will be side symptoms of infection. So phenotype mixing, the easiest way to identify this is the mentions of two infective virus. Both of them are functional. And another one is the, there is a mounting of uh, immune response. Okay, there is mounting of immune response. So once again, easily put, viral recombination is the exchange of genetic material. Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, I'm not. I have no clue why it says no connection. Okay, I just got a little bit worried. I'm thinking my internet was not working. Okay. Okay, so uh, viral recombination is uh, the exchange of two genetic materials, but the overall, the, there will always be an immune response because, uh, because both the viruses are functional. There is only combination of the chromosomes with a combination of the, of the surface protein. So this is a very easy one. Next one is reassortment. The word to look out for is segmentation, meaning that only segmented virus will undergo reassortment. That is, one segment will get transferred over here, and another, another segment will also get transferred along with the surface protein. Uh, viruses and concerned with segmented viruses are, are a very good example for the influenza, rotaviruses, and more segmented virus that we will talk about in the future. Next, um, next one is complementation. Complementation is one non-functional virus will complement a functional virus. That is, for example, we have the hepatitis D that will complement hepatitis, uh, I mean, hepatitis B that will complement hepatitis D. And then hepatitis D can work and cause the infection. And another one is phenotype mixing. Phenotype mixing is nothing but the exchange of surface proteins. Okay, the exchange of surface proteins, that's that, resulting in a new progeny virus. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Everyone, are we clear about this? <clears throat> 
what is progeny two? Progeny two is basically how, what what's happening with um, you have the exchange of the surface proteins, and when then with the exchange of the surface proteins, you have two new viruses. You have two new, new you have two new new viruses. That's that. Okay, so you have. Okay, reassortment is antigen shift. Antigen shift and antigen drift, I have not discussed this as of yet. I'll, I'll, I'll discuss this. Okay, I have not discussed this yet. I'll discuss this. But I, I have just only talked about recombination, reassortment, complementation, and phenotype mixing. Okay. Phenotype mixing is basically the mixing of the surface proteins resulting in two new viruses. Recombination in same virus. Recombination is not in same virus. Recombination is basically two viruses coming together to form another combined virus over here. That is recombination. Okay. Are we clear about this? Everyone, are we clear? Okay. No. Before, uh, okay, I'll talk about antigenic shift and antigenic drift in the future. So don't worry about it. Okay, now let's move on to DNA virus. Okay, DNA virus. Now, is everyone ready? Can we begin? Okay, so before we talked about the virus in general, we talked about how the virus has a nucleic acid, right? We talked about how the virus has a nucleic acid and the virus has a capsid, right? They have a capsid protein and then they have an envelope or something. If they have or they do not have. Now, will you get questions in your step one where they will try to describe the virus according to the fact that whether this nucleic acid is DNA or RNA, yes or no? Okay, DNA, either it's a DNA virus or it's an RNA virus. Okay, what is the, what is, which types of virus will have a faster rate of multiplication, DNA virus or RNA virus? Are you guys sure it's RNA virus? Okay, the reason why the answer could could not be RNA, but the answer could be DNA, it's because RNA has to be reverse transcribed into DNA first, and then that DNA has to be multiplied. DNA virus, on the other hand, they do not need to go any further process of reverse transcription. They can simply infect the cells, and the cells can increase their, uh, and then the cells can have their normal protein uh, synthesis. But if the RNA virus is a positive standard RNA virus, okay, if it's, a, if it's a positive standard RNA virus, then that's a different story, meaning that if it's a positive strand, then that, then that could be, um, that could be an easy, easy multiplication. So over there, you would not have to uh, use the need of reverse transcription. Now let, let's talk about DNA virus, okay? Let's talk about DNA virus and, and, and whether the DNA virus is whether the DNA virus is double-stranded or whether the DNA virus is single-stranded, okay? Now, the thing for you to understand is all DNA virus, all, all the DNA virus are double-stranded. All DNA virus are double-stranded except, except parvovirus, except parvovirus the virus responsible for causing aplastic crisis, right? In most of the, um, in, 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 in most of the cases is single stranded. So this is for you to understand. This is single strand virus. And all types of DNA virus are linear. All the DNA viruses are, are linear except P, P, H, PPH. PPH is papilloma, polyoma, and hepatinovirus, papilloma, polyoma, and hepatinovirus. So with that being said, if you have this knowledge over here, this, this knowledge itself will help you answer most of the questions 
this knowledge itself will help you answer most of the questions from step one. How? Okay, this um, knowledge itself will help you um, will help you answer most of the questions right now. If they talk about, for example, that they, if they talk about a DNA virus which is single stranded, linear, and uh, is, is responsible for causing, for example, a plastic crisis, you can just close your eyes and um, answer parvovirus, right? If they talk about single stranded DNA virus, the only virus that should come to your mind is parvovirus. If, if, however, they were to talk about double-stranded DNA virus, which were circular, so uh, this could either be papilloma, polyoma, or hepatinovirus. So this is how we are going to study the viruses. Instead of learning about each and every virus, for example, we can learn about all of these viruses when they when we talk about, for example, parvovirus. And then when we are discussing parvovirus, then we can learn that parvovirus is a DNA virus, it's a single-stranded virus. Instead of learning like that, we will learn the viruses as a whole right now, so that in the future, we can only learn what the virus is causing. That way, we don't have to um, that way we don't have to do we don't have to relearn or memorize the properties of the microorganism do you guys remember how we discussed bacteria yes or no that instead of talking about what they were we we broke it down from the beginning that whether it was gram positive whether it was gram negative if it was gram positive is it catalyst positive or not yes or no right do you guys remember how we talked about the bacteria we because instead of talking about, for example, let's say Staphylococcus and learning that Staphylococcus is gram positive, catalase positive, coagulase, coagulase positive, instead of learning that when we were learning Staphylococcus, we learned about Staphylococcus aureus before we jumped into Staphylococcus aureus discussion. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay, next one. So we are done with the DNA viruses. DNA viruses are all double-stranded except parvovirus, which is single-stranded. and all the viruses are linear except papilloma, polyoma, and hepatina. Are we clear with this piece of information? Yes or no? Okay, good. Next one. Next one is RNA virus. RNA viruses, all of the RNA viruses we, we have are basically single-stranded. Just as how all DNAs are double-stranded, all RNAs are single-stranded. But there's always a but except Rio virus, okay? Rio virus, which is a double, which is double-stranded. Rio virus. Does anyone know the names of Rio viruses? Rio virus, have you guys heard of Rio virus? Can anyone name one Rio virus? Do you guys remember rotavirus? Rotavirus is a Rio virus, okay? So rotavirus is a real virus. Real, real viruses are double-stranded. So if they talk about double-stranded RNA virus, the only viruses they're concerned is either real is either is real virus, real virus, and uh, most possibly the virus is rotavirus. And if they talk about single-stranded RNA virus, then they're talking about a lot more other things. Now, if it's a single-stranded, we just discussed that that single strands could be either positive, meaning that if it's a positive strand. It, it, it does not need reverse transcription. So it, it, it will be more infective. If it's a negative strand, it has to be reverse transcribed and it will be, it, it will take more time for the infection to take place. So it's important for us to learn that which one is, which are the positive stranded, which one are the negative stranded. And uh, we absolutely love the mnemonic that is provided in first aid. Okay, the mnemonic that is provided in first aid is basically, I went to a retro toga party where I drank flavored Corona and ate hippie California pickles. Okay, uh, it's a big one over here, but the viruses to be concerned is retrovirus, then you have toga virus, then you have flavivirus, then you have coronavirus. Okay, coronavirus right now, the one is naked and has a positive strand, that's why it's so infective. Then the next one is hepatinovirus, or I mean, hep, hep E virus, not hepatinovirus, hep E virus. Then you have California virus, which is Cal C virus. And the last one is Picorna virus, okay? So then the mnemonic goes something like this. I went to a retro toga 
party where I drank flavored Corona. Corona is the name of um, uh, an alcoholic beverage, right? And ate hippie California pickles. Hippie California pickles is talking about something which um, most, it sounds, it sounds like someone's going to a retro party to drink and have drugs, basically. So that's basically what, we, what it is. So retro toga. Then you have flabby Corona, then hep E, calci, and picorna. Okay. So these are all the positive standard virus. If you can uh, master this piece of information over here, then most of the questions of viruses can could be answered very, very easily. That is whenever they say that there's a single stranded positive, uh, there, uh, that there's a single stranded RNA virus, which is a positive strand. If they say single stranded RNA virus positive strand, then obviously your answer would, would, would be from one of these uh, seven viruses, right? Retro, Toga, Flavi, Corona, Hepi, Calci, Picorna, simple as that, okay? Are we clear about this, yes or no? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so can can anyone tell me the names of these ones without looking at this? I went to a retro toga party where I drank flavored Corona and ate hippie California pickles. Can anyone uh, confidently mention this the mnemonic or write down the mnemonic, whichever they prefer? Anyone? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. Is anyone confident to only mention the names of the positive stranded RNA virus? Okay, who can tell me the names of the positive standard RNA virus, please? Either it's a yes or a no. If it's a no, then I'll move on. So that I don't want to waste any more time. Yes, Dr. Jordan. Okay, so you will. So what are the names of the positive standard RNA viruses? Um, so there are a retrovirus, um, Toga virus. Retro. Um, yeah, retro Toga and for Corona is coronavirus and for flavored is flavivirus and for hippie is herpes virus and for California we have calci virus and pickles we have picorna virus. Okay, thank you so much for uh, mentioning the viruses. You won't happen to be looking at the book when you gave the answer, will you? Um, I am from California, so that's how I <laughs> memorized oh, it. Good. <laughs> Okay, so that is all. So those are the names of the positive stranded RNA virus. Thank you, Dr. Jordan, for mentioning the virus. We have retro, toga, flavi, corona, hepi, cal um, hepi, calci, and picorna virus. So these are the names of the viruses. So if you can remember that, that you, then you can easily answer most of the questions. So that's that. Next one is we want to move on to um, viral envelopes. We want to move on to viral envelopes. Which one are which one are naked viruses? Which one are not naked viruses? Okay, so if we have to talk about naked or not naked, we have to we have to take into concern that which ones are naked DNA. Okay, which ones are naked DNA? By naked, once again, we mean that the virus, that, that the virus, they lack an envelope. Naked DNA virus. These are the viruses which lacks an envelope. Okay. These are basically PAPP. PAPP stands for PAPP stands for papilloma. Okay, put your attention to this so that you can memorize it right away. So that you, you, you have to memorize less at home. Papilloma, adenoma, parvo, polyoma. Okay, papilloma, adenoma, parvo, polyoma. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Let me just recheck with first aid one more time to see if I'm saying the right thing. Yes, so it's papilloma, adenovirus, parvo, and polyoma so that's that's that so that these are the naked dna viruses and naked rna virus is cpr okay naked rna virus is cpr with cpr what you have is you have you have calcivirus 
Okay, you have P coronavirus, you have real virus, and you also have H, CPR H. Okay, it, CPR and happy H, H for hep E virus. So that, that, that. Okay, so um, these are the these are the naked viruses. So if you have this piece of information that these viruses over here are the naked viruses, then all the other viruses except these eight are enveloped virus. Do you understand? If they are talking about enveloped virus, then you can easily discard these eight viruses. That is uh, papilloma, adenoma, parvo, polioma, calci, picorna, rio, and happy virus. So that's that, okay? Are we clear about this, yes or no? Okay, so before uh, we move on to the next one, that is we will uh, move into the discussion of um, DNA viruses, okay? Uh, I, would ju I just want to give you guys one, uh, two minutes instead of one minute, I'm going to give you guys two minutes. In those two minutes, I want you to learn about all the little information which we just provided from first aid, uh, basically, that is, which are DNA viruses, who are the RNA viruses, uh, what are the names of the double-stranded DNA virus, what are the single-stranded DNA virus, which ones are linear, which ones are not linear, then which ones are single-stranded, which ones are not single-stranded, then which ones are naked, which ones are not naked viruses. Okay, so two minutes for this, for all the piece of information that we have just provided. It's 10.25 as of right now. I'll give you guys two minutes. You have, you have all the information you need over here. Okay, just read these. Okay, we didn't provide anything new. We used the exact same information that First Aid has provided because this is exactly all you need, nothing more or nothing less. So, before, so right after we have learned these things, I'll move on to over here. Okay, I'll give you guys two minutes at 10.25. I'll ask you the question at 10.27. The reason is, is because I want you to learn this right now instead of learning it at home because learning it right now will help you understand the things in the future faster. Okay. If anyone is ready before 10.27, please let me know that I'm ready to answer. Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. Okay, so it's 1027. Is everyone ready to answer the questions? Okay, so uh, let's talk about DNA viruses. What is what are what is the single-stranded DNA virus, and which viruses are double-stranded DNA virus? Parvo virus is a single-stranded virus the DNA, and everything else is double-stranded. Next one is RNA viruses. Which RNA viruses are single-stranded, and which RNA viruses are double-stranded? Okay, next one is which, which RNA viruses are negative stranded virus? Which RNA viruses are negative stranded? Can you guys hear my voice? Which RNA viruses are negative stranded viruses? Very good, the rest. I'm pretty sure by, by saying the rest, you guys mean 
all the viruses except except which one? Right, Toga, Retro, Flavi, Calci, Picorna, Happy. Right. Okay. Now let's talk about naked DNA virus. Which which viruses are naked DNA virus? Which DNA, which which RNA viruses are um, naked RNA virus? CPRH. Very good. Okay. CPRH. Okay. So that's that. Okay. Now let's talk about DNA viruses. Okay. DNA virus, DNA viruses. Now we are now we will begin our discussion with DNA virus. DNA viruses are very easy to learn, and um, they're not that much in the in uh, in amount. So DNA virus are basically, first of all, all the DNA viruses that we have just discussed are basically double stranded, except parvovirus, which is single stranded. The names of the DNA virus are these viruses are always very happy okay these are happy virus okay so we have four p's happy virus okay with hap e this is for h4 hepatinovirus then this one is for herpes virus this one is for adenovirus this one is for papilloma polioma Box and parvo. Okay, so once again, we have, once again, we have hepadna, herpes, adeno, hepadna, herpes, adeno, papilloma, polioma, pox, parvo. All these viruses are DNA virus. Out of these DNA virus, parvovirus is single stranded, all are double stranded. All of these viruses are linear virus, except hepadna virus, papilloma virus, and polioma virus. And um, all of these viruses, they are, they have a icosahedral capsid. They have a capsid, which looks like this. They have a capsid, which looks like this, except, um, except pox virus, okay? Pox virus, they do not have an icosahedral capsid. Okay, and all of these viruses they will replicate in the nucleus, except pox virus, which which will carry its own DNA dependent DNA polymerase. So basically, you have once again I'll put I'll put this information out for you so that you can learn it right now. First of all, with DNA virus, you have to learn the names of the DNA virus. That is with the mnemonic happy, hepadna, herpes, adeno, pox, polioma, parvo, and uh, pox, polioma, parvo, papilloma. Right? Okay. Then you have um, all the viruses that are double-stranded, except parvovirus, which is single-stranded. All the viruses are linear, except papilloma, polioma, and hepatina virus. So that's that. Next one is all the viruses are icosahedral, except pox virus, and all the virus will replicate in the nucleus, except pox, pox virus. Okay. So that is all you have to know. If you can know these informations over here, okay, this is this is not something which I made up by myself, obviously. It's over here. Just said the exact same thing, which first data has mentioned, except the fact that I just said it from my own knowledge. But uh, the confidence with which I have just said what I said, I need you guys to have that same level of confidence when you guys learn this, okay? So once again, these are all happy viruses. They're all double-stranded except parvovirus. They all have linears except papilloma, polioma, and hepadna. They are all icosahedral except pox. They all replicate in the nucleus except pox. So if you can learn about these characteristics, okay, then we know e easily what hepadna virus would do. We would know easily what herpes virus would do. All you have to know next is what will it do? For example, we all know what herpes does right we have hsv1 hsv2 what do they do if we can only learn those then we do not even have to learn the characteristics of the virus when we study them we can only uh, we can 
master this information over here and answer each and every question because USMLE step one has a tendency of asking more questions based on characteristics only. They will only ask you DNA, RNA, or if it's DNA, if it's linear or not and stuff. And that's how they will try to see whether you have the knowledge about the characteristics. So characteristics is extremely high yield. Once again, I cannot put enough emphasis on how important the characteristics are, okay? Are we clear? Was I successful in making you guys uh, making you guys understand where you have to put your focus on? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, can anyone mention what I mentioned with the same level of confidence without looking at without looking at the book regarding the DNA virus? Okay, Doctor Hassan, let's hear you mention the informations. Uh, yes, uh, all all the DNA viruses are comprised of uh, happy, okay. uh, hibadna, herpes, um, um, I don't know. adenovirus, then uh, papilloma, then polioma, then parvo, then pox. that's it. Yeah, sick. Oh, okay, pox. Yeah, small pox. Now, uh, yeah. let's move. Let's move. Uh, let's, talk about, them, let's talk about double-stranded or single-stranded. Okay, all of them are double except Barvo, which is single. Okay, now let's talk about let's talk about linearity. If which which all ones of, are linear genomes? All of them are linear except uh, Babova, except uh, Babova, Bulioma, and Babiloma, except Babiloma and Bulioma and Hibadna, which Hibadna, are okay. Babiloma, Bulioma, and, and Hibadna. Hibadna. Okay, which ones have icosahedral capsid? All of them accept box. Okay. Which one will replicate in the nucleus? All of them accept uh, box. Very good. Very good. So that's all. That is all. So very good. So uh, has everyone understood this? Thank you so much, Dr. Hassan, for um, mentioning this. Okay. Has everyone understood this? Okay. So now what I will do is I'll talk about each of these viruses single-handedly, and uh, I'll ask the questions to all the doctors one by one, not everyone will answer. Okay, the questions will be regarding, so we, I'll talk about the name of the virus, and then I'll talk about whether the virus has an envelope or does not have an envelope, does not have an envelope. Then I'll talk about linearity, whether the virus is linear, and whether the virus has a double strand or a single strand, okay? So we'll talk about um, the DNA of the virus, and then I'll talk about the, cl the clinical features, okay? First one, the first virus that I want to talk about is herpes virus, okay? Uh, the first, no, I'll talk about POGS virus at first, okay? I'll, let me talk about POGS virus, okay? POGS virus, and the answer that I need is from Dr. Dr. Adenov. Dr. Adenov, would you be able to tell me if, if POGS virus, if they have an envelope or they do not have an envelope? Last answers, please. Pogs virus. Do they have an envelope or do they not have an envelope? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay. Okay, everyone, Pogs virus, fast answers. I do not have all day. Uh, as a matter of fact, we do not have all day. So Pogs virus, enveloped or not enveloped? Envelope, okay. Envelope virus. Okay, which are the naked DNA virus? Naked DNA virus, PAP. With PAP we have papilloma, adeno, then polioma, parvo, very good. DNA, is it double-stranded or single-stranded? This is double-stranded. Is it circular, linear, what type of DNA is this? All are linear except, all are linear except PPH. PPH stands for papilloma, polioma, hepatna. Very good. Okay. Pox virus. What does pox virus cause? Chicken pox. As simple as that, right? Right? Are we clear? Chicken box. And another one is this piece of lesion over here. This 
is a very important one. This type of presentation, okay? This lesion over here, as you can see in the skin, in the skin this lesion with raised, this is a raised lesion with a central umbilication, central umbilication. Okay, I need you to focus on this one over here. Okay, this is a, for example, if this is the skin, there could be a lesion, which is, if you're looking at this from the top, then there will be a central umbilication of the lesion. This is known as molluscum contagiosum. Mom this is known as molluscum contagiosum, and this is extremely high yield for step one. Okay, this is extremely high yield for step one. M, M, molluscum contagiosum. Okay, this is a, this is basically a papule with a central umbilication. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Next one. Next one that I want to talk about is hepatinovirus. Hepatina virus. Okay. Is it envelope or not envelope? Okay, it's envelope. Okay. Is it a okay? Is it double stranded or single stranded? Okay. Is it linear or not linear? It's it's linear. Do you, do, you, do you guys remember all are linear except PPH? PPH was, you guys just said this, it's parvo. Is it parvo? No, it's papilloma, polyoma, and hepatina. So it's not linear, okay? Is it circular? Yes. Okay. Hepatinovirus. Well, what would it cause? Hepatinovirus is hepatitis B virus. It will cause hepatitis B. Okay. And, and another thing, hepatinovirus, although it's double-stranded, hepatinovirus is partially double-stranded. Partial double-stranded virus. This partial double-stranded virus allows the, hepatina, allows the hepatitis D virus to uh, act as a functional virus when it comes in close contact. When the hepatitis D virus comes in close contact with hepatitis B, the non-functional virus transforms into a functional virus. Well, what is this process called? Complementation. Okay. Very good. Next one, okay. No. no. Pox virus uh, will cause molluscum contagiosum. Uh, to be honest, to some extent, pox viruses will cause, um, well, we, 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 we basically don't talk about smallpox anymore because smallpox has been eradicated from the world. But molluscum contagiosum is another one. It, it will also cause another one, which is between known as cowpox. Uh, and chickenpox over here, which I mentioned is caused Small amount by some strains of pox virus, but it's more for varicella, okay, varicella zoster. So, but over here, focus on molluscum contagiosum, okay. And this one, let's let's say it's cowpox, okay, cowpox. Chickenpox. Focus on chickenpox with varicella zoster. Are, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Next one. Next one that I want to talk about is so we have we have H H hepatina herpes. Then the next one is adenovirus. Adeno. Okay. Adenovirus. Is it envelope or not envelope? Mm -hmm. Not envelope. Okay. Is it double stranded or single stranded? Okay. Is it linear or not linear? Linear. Okay, adenovirus. And ad adenovirus is responsible for causing a lot of uh, different types of infection. Basically, it, this, is the this is the virus that is responsible for causing um, 
you, there could be pharyngitis, pneumonia, viral pneumonia, viral conjunctivitis, viral gastroenteritis. But out of all the things, the most um, the most weird and difficult one to remember is that this virus causes acute hemorrhagic cystitis. And since this is the most difficult clinical feature to remember, because when you think about adenovirus, you obviously don't think about hemorrhagic cystitis right away, right? But I just want to give this a special mention because this is where the step one questions usually pinpoints. To some extent, uh, they expect you to understand and uh, they expect you to remember that adenovirus is the main culprit for hemorrhagic cystitis. So um, that's that. Okay, so do not forget this one. With, for example, for all the organs in the body that can get affected with adenovirus, for example, for eyes, the conjunctiva, okay, you can even get sinusitis, you can even get for lungs, it's pneumonia, for heart, it's myocarditis, for just GI, it's gastroenteritis. So everything we can get affected with adenovirus except that when it affects the bladder, it causes acute hemorrhagic cystitis, not normal cystitis, it causes hemorrhagic cystitis. So please do not forget this. Okay, next one. Next one that I want, that I want to talk about is HHAP. So we talked about one P that is pox. Another one that we want to talk about is, another one that I want to talk about is papilloma. Papilloma virus. Okay. Papilloma, papilloma virus. Is it enveloped or not enveloped? Is it, is it envelope? Not envelope, meaning it's a naked virus. Is it double-stranded or single-stranded? Double-stranded. Okay, is it linear or not linear? All are linear except PPH. So PPH stands for papilloma, polyoma, and hepatoma. So it's not linear. Is it circular? Papilloma virus, we know that papilloma virus is responsible for causing HPV, am I correct? Yes or no? HPV, right? So we have, we have non-carcinogenic and we have carcinogenic, right? You guys remember that non-carcinogenic and carcinogenic for the carcinogenics, we have 16, 18. For non-carcinogenics, we have 1, 2, 6, 11, right? So that's that, okay. Next one, next one is polyoma virus, polyoma virus, okay? Next one is? Polyoma virus. Polyoma virus, is it envelope or not envelope? Is it envelope? It's not envelope, P-A-P-P, -P -P. okay? Then is it double-stranded or single-stranded? Double-stranded, okay? Is it linear or circular? Circular. Okay. Polyoma virus is responsible for causing. Polyoma virus is responsible for causing JC. JC is John Cunningham virus. John Cunningham is the name of the person who um, identified the virus as at, at, at first. Okay. So JC virus is John Cunningham virus. This is responsible for causing a very important disease known as PML. PML is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. PML. What is the name of the drug that is just, that can also cause PML? We, we studied that before. Let's see who remembers it. It's a pretty difficult question. The name of one drug that can cause PML. We studied that drug in immuno, in immunology. Let's see who remembers. What is the name of the drug that causes PML? Influximab is not the right answer. Anyone else? Which drug is responsible for causing PML? Which drug is responsible for causing PML? Because that drug has the ability to make the dormant form of JC virus, not dormant and active. Very good. Ritu, Rituxi. Okay, good. Ritu and Rituxi, I'm pretty sure. Do you guys mean it's Rituximab for CD20? Okay. Okay, we had another student who wrote nitru. Okay, I, I'm not sure what nitru represents, but rituximab is the one. Okay, so JC virus, 
Another one is BK virus, okay? JC virus and BK virus, BK virus. Okay? BK virus is basically a transplantation virus uh, that, is, that can happen in transplanted patients, okay? So these are the polyoma virus. And last but not least, the virus of the virus of the hour, right? Parvovirus, okay. Now, is it is it envelope or not envelope? If this is not envelope. Is it double-stranded or single-stranded? Single-stranded, I'm pretty sure was, I'm pretty sure you guys were waiting to mention single stranded for so long because everything was double stranded. Okay, is it linear or not linear? Okay, so it's linear. Parvovirus is responsible for causing aplastic crisis. Aplastic crisis with the help of parvovirus B19. Parvovirus B19 is the strain. And aplastic crisis in children, this looks, for example, the, 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 these children will, will not only have uh, pancytopenia, they will have, for example, if this is a child, okay, if this is a child, this child looks like he or she got slapped on the cheeks. He or she looks like they got slapped on the cheek. They have a slapped cheek appearance or bilateral uh, facial rash or bilateral facial rash, okay? This aplastic crisis, uh, does it happen to everyone or does it ha happen to only people or patients who have a previously um, diagnosed condition? Aplastic crisis. Right, they, they, they are more common in patients who have a previously diagnosed condition. So that's that. Okay, so that is about DNA virus. Now let's talk about, let's talk about herpes virus. Okay, let's talk about herpes virus. Herpes virus, once again, herpes, is it a DNA or an RNA virus? Is it a DNA virus or is it an RNA virus? It's a DNA virus. Is it envelope or not envelope? It's envelope. Is it uh, uh, double stranded or single stranded? Double stranded. Is it linear, circular? Linear. Okay. So it's an envelope, double stranded DNA virus, which is linear. Now, herpes is something which we want to discuss from over here. Okay. Herpes virus, no. Herpes virus, let's talk about herpes virus, HSV1, HSV2. This is something which we will read right now and you guys will memorize this at home, okay? We will read through this. The different strains of herpes. Herpes simplex one, the route of transmission is basically via the respiratory secretion, secretions or saliva. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen a lot of patients with herpes, right? They stay dormant in the trigeminal area, the, I mean in the trigeminal ganglia, okay? The dormant sites for all the herpes viruses are extremely high yield, so don't mess this up. HSV1 is for trigeminal ganglia, and when this uh, flares up, okay, when you get infected with herpes, you, this easily does not get treated. This stays dormant in ganglia, and there is flaring. Flaring means that when your immune system drops, for example, in cases of fever or any other case, then the virus flares up. This is known as flaring. Flaring happens and causes gingival stomatitis, conjunctivitis, herpes labialis, this is known as cold sore, herpetic whitlow on the finger, this is very, this is a very painful condition. Herpetic whitlow is basically, um, you, you have a small blister-like presentation on the finger and this is extremely painful. And then temporal lobe encephalitis. I, I do not want you guys to ever forget the fact that HSV1 is responsible for causing viral encephalitis, okay? Especially temporal lobe encephalitis. Whenever you see a question about, question about viral encephalitis, think about herpes simplex one, okay? Herpes simplex one, that's that, okay? But this is the most common cause of sporadic encephalitis, see? Most common cause of sporadic encephalitis and can present as altered mental status, seizure, and aphasia, 
So that, that, that's why in patients who uh, get meningitis and we are not sure which drug to prescribe, whether we should prescribe an antibiotic or whether we should prescribe an antiviral, we usually have the tendency of combining both antibiotic and antiviral together. So we give uh, drugs such as, uh, such as penicillins uh, along with, um, I mean, we give drugs such as, be such as beta-lactams along with acyclovirs to target herpes simplex one. That's how common this is. Next one is herpes simplex two. Herpes simplex two is for sexual contact patients. Okay, this is a sexually transmitted disease because it is responsible for causing herpes genitalis or neonatal herpes. Neonatal herpes is basically if the mother has HSV2 in the birth canal, then this can get passed on to the babies and this causes um, herpes conjunctivitis, right? Uh, so that's that. Most common, this is, a, this is, this stays dormant in sacral ganglia. So this stays, this is for trigeminal ganglia, this is for sacral ganglia. This is viral, this causes viral meningitis more common with HSV2 than with HSV1, okay? So meningitis and encephalitis, both are different things. So that's what you have to understand. Encephalitis is more common with herpes simplex one. Meningitis, viral meningitis is more common with herpes simplex two, okay? This is a little piece of information that is very high yield and it remains hidden over here. And now you can crack it, okay? So encephalitis for for herpes simplex one and meningitis for herpes simplex two. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Is everyone with me? Do I have everyone's attention? Okay. Now let's talk about herpes virus three, which is, which is known as varicella zoster. Varicella zoster is basically the virus that is responsible for causing chicken pox, right? Not uh, pox virus. Pox virus is responsible for causing smallpox, cowpox, or mollusk conjunctiviosum. And small amounts of pox virus can cause chicken pox, but most of the chicken pox is caused by varicella zoster. Varicella zoster, uh, the route of transmission is respiratory droplets or contact with infected individuals. So close contact or respiratory droplets. This is responsible for causing chicken pox or shingles. Now, okay. Can anyone describe me the, the virus that is responsible for causing chicken pox in terms of enveloped, double strand, single strand, DNA, RNA, linearity, and um, linearity, and that's that's that. Okay, chicken pox virus. Can anyone describe me the virus which is responsible for causing chicken pox? There you go. Double stranded linear envelope virus. Okay. The double stranded linear envelope virus. Now, this is this will stay latent in the dorsal root, dorsal ganglia or trigeminal ganglia, and the CNV1 branch involvement can cause herpes zoster ophthalmicus. Okay, I'm pretty sure you guys have no known about this. The most common complication of shingles is post herpetic neuralgia. This is a very common thing. Basically, after you recover from the disease, then there can be uh, pains and sensations in the pathway of the dorsal root of trigeminal nerve. So that can cause post-herpetic neuralgia. That is for varicella zoster. Now, next one is Epstein-Barr virus. If you have a patient with fever, hepatosplenomegaly, and uh, lymphadenopathy, and negative heterophile antibody test, which, uh, what is the disease? Let's see who remembers. Fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, and negative heterophilic antibody test. Very good. Why are you guys mentioning CMV? We did not talk about CMV yet. Toxoplasma gondii. Very good. We talked about this yesterday, guys. Uh, you have to remember what we talked about yesterday. Do you guys remember? Toxoplasma gondii is responsible for causing mononucleosis like symptoms with a negative heterophilic antibody test. Okay, so do not mess this up. Fever, fever, hepatosplenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy. Next one is if we have fever, hepatosplenomegaly, and lymphadenopathy with positive heterophilic antibody test, we said yesterday that the virus, you're, that it's a virus, not a parasite. The virus is Epstein-Barr virus, okay? This is basically known as kissing virus because, or kissing disease, because it's transmitted via respiratory secretions or saliva. 
it is responsible for causing mononucleosis or what we say mono, meaning that it's a very uh, common term used over here. That is for any patient who can get fever and lymphadenopathy together is expected to be said as a mono patient by local individuals. Okay, but as physicians, you have to know that fever and lymphadenopathy is not mono, that this could also be toxoplasmosis. So, so that's that, that's the difference. Next one is not only is fever and lymphadenopathy important, the patients need to have hepatosplenomegaly, the patients need to have pharyngitis. So fever, hepatosplenomegaly, pharyngitis, and lymphadenopathy. Okay, and these patients, since they have splenomegaly, we cannot uh, allow them to be in close contact with um, we cannot allow them to be in close contact with other people. Why? Because since they have a splenomegaly, if they are playing contact sports, for example, American football, then there could be splenic rupture and the patient can die from internal hemorrhage of the splenic artery. So that's that. It is associated with a lot of different types of carcinomas and we know this very well. First and foremost is Barkett's lymphoma. This is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We talked about this in, um, we talked about this in hematology. Then nasopharyngeal carcinoma is one of the most highest yield ones. And, and another one is primary CNS lymphoma. So it's not mentioned over here, but that's that. It will infect the B cells. Do you guys remember we talked about how it infects the B cells, CD21? CD21 of B cell. How many CDs are there in B cells? How many CDs are there in B cells? What are the three CDs? 19, 20, 21, very good. And it affects CD21 over here. The one of the most highest yield thing over here is when you when you when they ask you questions about Epstein Barr, Epstein Barr virus, okay, okay. Um, do you guys know who Jeffrey Epstein is? Jeffrey Epstein. Okay, Jeffrey Epstein is he is he a, is he a typical person, like you and me, or is he an abnormal atypical person? He is an abnormal atypical person. So atypical Epstein for atypical lymphocytes. You will see atypical lymphocytes on peripheral blood smear. Okay. You will see atypical lymphocytes on peripheral blood smear, these types of lymphocytes. Okay. This, this is extremely, extremely high yield. Atypical lymphocyte, not infected uh, B cells, but reactive cytotoxic T cells. These are basically what you will see over here. That is lymphocytes with atypical appearance of the nuclei or an atypical uh, shape and size. Okay, the the monospot test over here that is heterophilic antibody test is positive. If it's not positive, then we can think about toxoplasmosis. If it's if it's positive, it's Epstein Barr virus. And heterophilic antibody test is detected by agglutination of sheep or horse RBC. And we use amoxicillin in mononucleosis, and that can cause macular papular rash. Okay, this is not high yield, so don't worry about this. Okay, so don't worry about this. Okay, so I previously thought that we should watch a video on Epstein Barr virus from Physio to make sure we remember all the information, but I feel like you guys can do without a video. Yes or no? Because the information's over here, although it's a lot of information, but we have discussed these information so much in previous topics that um, we should be more than confident when we talk about Epstein Barr virus. Okay. Okay, with that being said, you guys will um, once again uh, have the homework of, of reading and memorizing these informations. We usually ask you guys to memorize these informations right away during our classes, right? Yes or no? Okay, but we are not going to ask you to do it during microbiology because for the amount of chapters we have to cover. So instead of doing you work questions at home, you need to memorize these things at home. Okay, so do, do, do not do you work questions until and unless you guys have these things memorized. Next one is cytomegalovirus. Cytomegalovirus is HHV5. Five. Five. five is for cytomegalovirus, okay? Um, cytomegalovirus is transmitted either by sexual contact, saliva, urine, transplant, any close contact with an infected individual who, ha who is having discharges, cytomegalovirus, trans trans transmission. Cytomegalovirus can cause mononucleosis in immunocompetent patients. 
infection in immunocompromised patients, especially in pneumonia in transplant patients, esophagitis, AIDS, retinitis. Now we can talk about mononucleosis with negative monospot test. Okay, but now this can also this now this can also cause mononucleosis, that is fever, hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, and if we do the, the heterophilic antibody test or the monospot test, if it's negative, then we can think about cytomegalovirus or we can think about toxoplasma condi. Okay, so this can cause negative monospot mononucleosis immunocompetent in immunocompetent patient and infections in immunocompromised patient, especially pneumonia. So CMV pneumonia is very common. Uh, CMV pneumonitis is very common in AIDS patient. Esophagitis is very common. CMV esophagitis, okay, will it cause a linear lesion or a transverse lesion in the in the in the esophagus? Linear, okay. Write it down. Linear ulcers, linear esophageal ulcers in AIDS patient. Close your eyes, and click cytomegalovirus, okay, and select cytomegalovirus. AIDS patient, it, it can also cause retinitis, that is CMV retinitis, okay? And it can also cause um, congenital cytomegalovirus infection, okay? So uh, in CMV retinitis, what are you expected to have? You're expected to have cotton wool exudates and vision loss, okay? Cotton wool exudates and vision loss. Infected cells have characteristic owl's eye intranuclear inclusions like this one. Owl's eye intranuclear inclusion. This looks like the... Uh, I'll, uh, this looks like an eye of an owl, okay? This is extremely high. Your intranuclear owl's eye inclusion is very diagnostic for uh, cytomegalovirus, okay? And this stays latent in mononuclear cells. This stays latent in mononuclear cells, okay? Can you guys just give me one minute? Just give me one minute. Okay, can you guys hear my voice? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, good. So we are done with cytomegalovirus. Once again, cytomegalovirus will cause negative monospot mononucleosis in immunocompetent patient. And the thing to look out for over here is intranuclear Alzheimer's inclusion. Intranuclear Alzheimer's inclusion, which will stay late and then mononuclear cells. Okay, next one is. Um, HHV6 and HHV7, okay? This is one of the most common cause of um, roseola infantum. Roseola infantum is basically um, fever first and rash later. Fever first and rash later, meaning that, first of all, the, the child will have fever for several days, but specifically it's three days. And right after three days, for, you, for USMLE step one, that is U world uses three days, Okay, so please we'll write down three days over here. Exactly after three days of uh, fever, the child will have severe maculopathy or macular rash, which will start on the trunk and then it will spread to the extremities. So this is because um, this is this is because this child had a previous history of being uh, in close contact with an infected individual who had HHV six and seven in this in this saliva, but it did it did not affect that individual because it's an adult. But they, these viruses, they have a tendency of infecting young infants. So that, that, that's why it's called roseola infantum. So there will be high fever for several days, especially three days 
And then right after three days, there will be diffuse macular rash. That is HIV six and seven. That's all you need to know for that one. Another one is HIV eight, which is responsible for causing KPOC sarcoma. KPOC sarcoma is this one over here. Okay, this is a neoplasm of endothelial cells seen in AIDS patient. And this is basically dark, violaceous plaques or nodules. And it, rep it represents angiogenesis, meaning vascular proliferation. This is a, this is a neoplasm of endothelial cells. So there's angiogenesis. It can also affect GI tract and lungs if there's a capsule to come over there. This can result in extreme uh, bleeding like conditions. For example, patients can have profuse, um, what we can say is um, uh, bleeding from the GI tract, right? And they can also have bleeding from the lungs. So you're looking at uh, blood with cough or you are looking for melana, okay? Melana is basically dark stool. So that, that's that. That's for herpes virus. Okay. Are we all clear about this? Yes or no? Are we all clear about the herpes viruses? Can you guys hear my voice? Are we all clear about the herpes virus? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, now. If you have to identify herpes, okay, we can either do one of three tests. Okay, let's talk about this over here. First of all, if you if you think that your patient has a herpes virus, okay, first of all, the first thing that you will do is, um, first of all, for example, let's say that there, there's a skin involvement, okay? So you take a small sample of the skin and you, what you do is you do a viral culture. You culture the virus, okay, if there's growth, and when there's growth, if the virus that you identify is enveloped, double-stranded, and then the virus is a the virus is a is it's a it's a linear virus, right? Then it's a DNA virus. Then you can easily conclude that this virus is a herpes virus. Another one is if it's uh, herpes encephalitis for HSV one, you can always do a CSF study, right? If if you, if it's a CSF study, that's what you can do. Another one is you can do a Jank smear. Okay, you can do a Zank smear. And this is very high yield because when you do a Zank smear, okay, so what you do is you, you uh, the, the HSV viruses, they have a tendency of causing vesicular lesions, right? Small vesicles with fluid inside, like small, small very, very small blister like conditions, right? So you take that fluid and what you do is you smear that fluid with a Zank smear. And by doing that, you try to see whether you can identify multi nucleated giant cells. If you can find multi-nucleated giant cells in any type of vesicular lesion, then you can you can confirm that it's a herpes virus. Okay. Another one is um another, another one is there's this intranuclear eosinophilic cowdery A inclusion that is seen in HSV1 and 2. But I feel like this is cowdery A inclusion knowledge is very um, uh, it's it's beyond the scope of step one so you don't have to focus on this one. Okay, this one is important. This is the multinucleated giant cells. That's seen with the Zank test. That's how you can identify herpes virus. Okay, are we all clear about this? Yes or no? Are we all clear about herpes? Okay. Yes, okay, good. So before we jump into this one, receptors used by the viruses, do you guys want to take a small break for 15 minutes and then come back? Okay. Do you guys realize how fast your response is when we're gonna ask you about breaks? Okay, do you, do you guys have the same, do you guys have the same response when I ask you questions regarding for example, uh, viruses, <laughs> okay? Because when I ask you questions regarding viruses, like, am I clear? Have you guys understood? Can anyone tell me? Okay. So with that being said, thank you so much for putting your attention for the DNA virus. The, we're done with this. We are gonna come back from the break and we'll talk about the receptors and RNA viruses. So let's take a break for 10 to, 10 to 15 minutes. Let's clear up 
clear our head and let's come back. It's 11.13. We'll come back and start the lecture at 11.28. Okay.
Okay, so is everyone back from their break? Can you guys hear my voice? Okay, that's great. <clears throat> Okay, so the weekend is coming up, guys. Do you guys have any plans for your weekends? Yes or no? You guys have studied hard throughout the whole week, learned microbiology, um, memorized microbiology as much as possible. You guys are allowed to have some fun on the weekend. Do you guys have any plans? Okay, what plans do you guys have? Let me hear Study and more study, that sounds like a very good weekend. Very good, okay? That's what a step one students, that's how a step one students weekends should be, study and NBA. Okay. Uh, that being said, that was a joke. Um, please try to have some fun on the weekends. Have to finish your questions, of course you do, but you also need to uh, take some time off, cool off, and uh, make sure that you guys take one day off at least to make sure that you guys uh, give your time give yourself some time to um, enjoy okay or else you guys will be uh, burned out very quick so make sure that you guys have one day off no matter what do not study at all at least for one time of the day let's say in the evening or in the afternoon if you have to solve something solve in the morning on the weekends and take the rest of the day off okay okay so with that being said can we begin our discussion with the rna viruses Are we all uh, rejuvenated and um, calm and content after taking that small break? Are we ready? Do we have a clear head? Okay. Perfect. No. Let's start talking about the receptors used by some viruses. No. Are you willing to skip the table? No. Okay. We'll talk about the receptors, about some viruses. Okay. First of all, Okay, first of all, let's talk about the most easiest receptor there is. That is the receptor for Epstein Barr virus. What is the receptor for Epstein Barr virus that gets attacked? That attacks. Epstein Barr virus will go and attack CD21. You have to be 21 years old to drink beer, Epstein beer virus. Okay, 21 years old. So Epstein Barr virus with CD21. Okay, Epstein Barr virus is CD21. Next one, next one is HIV. HIV virus, HIV virus, which, which, um, what are the receptors for HIV virus? CD4 is number one. Then, which one? You guys remember CXCR4 and CCR5? We talked about this in the previous chapter, right? CX, CR4 and CCR5. Okay, next one. Next one is parvovirus. Which one does parvovirus B19 affect? Which cells, RBC, WBC, or platelet? Fast answers, please. RBC. In the RBC, we have an antigen. So P for parvovirus, P for P antigen. Okay, P antigen on RBC. Are we clear? Okay, next one. Next one is, do you see a lot of rhinos these days? Yes or no, rhino, the animal rhino. Do you see a lot of rhino these days? No. If you were to see a rhino, would you not want to take a picture with the rhino? Right? So there's a new camera, which you should learn for rhinoviruses that you should usually Take a picture of a rhinovirus with that one. That the name of the camera is iCam One. iCam One. So the, the name of the receptor is iCam One, and the name of the camera with which you should take a picture of the rhino is iCam One. So the rhinovirus is iCam One. Okay. <clears throat> Next is rabies virus. Rabies. 
will it affect um, will it affect acetylcholine receptors? Yes or no? Rabies virus. Rabies virus affects nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Okay, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Last one. Last one is learning about cytomegalovirus. Isn't it? Is it an integral part of USMA step one or not? Integral part of USMA step one is learning about cytomegalovirus. So can we assume that cytomegalovirus, the receptor is integrins. Yes. Yes or no? Okay. Now, once again, cytomegalovirus, what is the receptor for cytomegalovirus? Fast answers. Cytomegalovirus, not Epstein-Barr virus. Integris, I ju just said this, I, I just said this. Integral part of learning step one is learning about cytomegalovirus. It's integral. What is the receptor for Epstein Barr virus? CD21. What is the receptor for HIV virus? What is the receptor for parvovirus? What is the receptor for rabies virus? What is the receptor for rhinovirus? Very good, I came on. So are we clear about the receptors? Okay. Will we make mistakes in the future when we are uh, tested with the receptors? Will we make mistakes with the future in the future when we are tested with the receptors? Very good, never. Okay, so that's very good confidence. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's move on to RNA viruses right now. Okay, let's move on to RNA virus. RNA viruses. RNA viruses should be learned once again, according to envelope if they have or, or they do not have all envelope, whether they are DNA or RNA. That's a very weird question because we are we are learning about RNA virus. So, yeah. so all the viruses are RNA, right? Okay. Next one is capsid, whether it's icosahedral or helical capsid. And next one is the medical importance. We'll talk about this later. Okay, now, first one. RNA virus, what we have learned, another one that I want to talk to you about is positive strand or negative strand. Okay, now. Um, okay, now. Okay, let me just cut this off and write single strand or double strand. Okay. okay, now let's discuss what we learned in the first hour of our lecture today. First of all is RNA virus. Are all RNA viruses are enveloped, except which are the naked RNA virus? Which are the naked RNA viruses? CPRH. PAP is for DNA, CPRH is for RNA. What, what, for what? Okay, CPRH. So with CPRH, we have Corona Picorna, right? Then it's not Kelsey. Sort Kelsey. CPRA stands for Corona, Picorna, Rio, and which one? Fast answer, please. Kelsey is not the right answer, guys. Oh, naked virus, right? My apologies, my apologies. Okay, once again, CPRH, CPRH is Calci. Calci is there, my apologies. I 
Kelsey is naked. Yes, yes, it's naked. It's naked. My apologies. Okay, because I have to. Uh, I was thinking for my own knowledge. So my apologies. I think I mix it up. Okay. This is why I sometimes make mistakes because I take the I, I give the lecture from my own knowledge. Okay, Kelsey. Kelsey is there. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Once again, CPRH. Kelsey is there. Then P four. P4, P corner, R4, Rio, very good, H4, happy, okay, good. Now, let's first talk about, okay, now, uh, are, can we assume that all the viruses in the world are RNA virus except the happy virus? happy virus, happy, which is H-H-A-P-P-E-Y. So if you are ever confused about whether a virus is RNA or DNA, can you think about the fact that DNA viruses are happy virus? If it's herpes, hepatina, adeno, pox, papilloma, polioma, parvo, those are all DNA. Every other virus in the world except those viruses are RNA virus, so, so that is done. Okay, so that, that's how you can identify RNA virus. That's number one. Next one is if they're talking about envelopes or not envelopes, then can we assume that all the RNA viruses are enveloped except Calci, Picorna, Rio, and Hepi? Okay, good. Next one is next one is where we are going to talk about single stranded or double stranded. Um, can we assume? that all the RNA viruses are single-stranded, except which one is double-stranded that we have just learned? Rio virus, very good, okay. Now, the one that I did, I did not mention is all the viruses, all viruses are icosahedral, except A, B, write this down. This is not in your first aid. This is, this, this is a, not in your first aid. Um, all the viruses are icosahedral except A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, and pro, P, R, O, meaning that you are a professional at learning A, B, C, D, E, F. These viruses are helical. Okay. These viruses have a helical capsid. So with A, you have arena virus. With B, you have bunya virus. With C, you have coronavirus. With D, you have delta virus. E is apparently nothing, so there's nothing for E. F is for phylo, not flabby. Okay, F is for phylo virus. Okay, P is for P is for paramyxovirus. R is for rhabdovirus, meaning okay, rhabdovirus or rabies virus, right? Rhabdovirity, rhabdovirus. O is for orthomyxovirus ortho mixo virus all of these viruses are helical capsid so if they mention a helical capsid virus then these are the viruses that you have to think about okay did you guys write this down if you guys did can i get a yes in the chat box pro pro is for paramyxo rhabdo ortho mixo Paramyxo, rhabdo, orthomyxo. Now I just want to go to first aid and see whether I have given the right information or not, because I do not want to give you guys the wrong information. Okay. Arena virus, helical. Bunya virus, helical. Coronavirus, helical. Delta virus, uncertain. Okay. So delta virus could be helical or not helical. Okay. It's uncertain. E is for nothing, F is for phylo, helical, paramyxo, helical, orthomyxo, helical, and 
rhabdo is helicococcus. So I have given the right information. So that's that. Okay. So did you guys, I, I need you guys to write this piece of information somewhere over here. Okay. R write these informations in, in this part of your first aid if needed. Okay. So no U world micro without memorization. Uh, would you be able to rephrase the question I, or ask the question by un unmuting yourself? What is the question? What is the question, Dr. Zoom user? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was asking, you said that we shouldn't attempt the new world questions until we uh, memorize the micro. Right, so the, the thing is, um, the way we are studying microbiology for the last five days is, uh, usually what I ask uh, all our students to do is um, we solve first aid. I mean, we do first aid in the morning and then the rest of the day should be spent on doing U world questions. That's the motto of uh, our, our lectures. But for this week only, uh, I have been asking everyone to instead of doing U world questions for this week, the things at which we study in the lecture, we ask the students to memorize those things at first. So most of them uh, are doing exactly that. So for the first five days, that's what we would be doing. And after we have memorized all the information, then we can uh, incorporate and apply that knowledge when we do UWorld next week. So next week we will be doing UWorld micro. So that's that, okay? So because the thing is, I do not want you guys to start doing UWorld microbiology with all the proper, uh, without the proper information or the knowledge so that, um, so that, um, I do not get, um, I mean, so that you guys do not get intimidated by the amount of information that's there, okay? All right, thanks. You are welcome, okay. Okay, so that's that. So that's about helical capsid and icosahedral capsid. Okay. Now, let's talk about this table and see how we can understand this table. Uh, it, this can be a little bit intimidating at first, but we, in no time, we will master all this information. So, okay. now. so we have learned about all of these things. Now we'll talk about the viruses one by one. So we'll talk about the viruses one by one. And just as how we discussed the DNA virus, we will be discussing the RNA viruses. Okay. We will be discussing the RNA virus now. Okay. So first of all, we'll talk about the virus with the name of the virus. We'll talk about the virus in terms of um, whether the virus is enveloped or not enveloped, just it's exactly how it's here. We'll learn this over here, okay? Enveloped or not enveloped, then we'll talk about the structure of the RNA, RNA structure, okay? Then we'll talk about the capsid, and then we'll talk about importance medically. Okay, the name, the first name of the virus is Rio virus. I'm pretty sure that's the virus over there, okay, Rio virus. Okay. Let's talk about real virus at first. Real virus, enveloped or not enveloped? Fast answers, please. Is it enveloped or not enveloped? Not enveloped. Is it double stranded or single stranded? Double stranded. Is it positive? Is it a positive strand or a negative strand? Fast answers, please. Okay. There is no positive or negative strand. This is a double-stranded RNA virus. So that was a trick question. Okay, there is no positive or negative strand. You have to understand double-stranded viruses. There is no positive or negative strand. Okay, are we clear? Oh, are we clear about this? Okay, now, 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 capsid-wise, is it icosahedral or is it, or is it helical? It's DNA, it's not DNA, it's double-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, okay? It's icosahedral, very good, icosahedral, okay. Now, another one is, is it segmented or not segmented? Okay, is it segmented or is it not segmented? Now, 
Can we just talk about the segmentation really quick? Okay, we'll just talk about the segmentation really quick so that we can all make better um, we'll make better answers. And the segment the seg the segmentation of the viruses can be easily learned with the help of one mnemonic from first aid, which I will tell you as soon as this page opens in Kami. And here it is. Okay. So segmentation. Segmentation is B O A R. Boarding a flight number 382 in flight number 382, you're, you're boarding on this flight at flight number 382 in 10 to 12 minutes. 10 to 12 minutes. That's with that, it's Bunya virus, which is a segmented virus. All of these four viruses are segmented virus. So you have Bunya virus, Orthomexovirus. Arena virus and you have real virus. These are all segmented virus. Bunya virus have a segment of three. Orthomixo have a segment of eight. Arena virus have a segment of two. And real virus have a segment of 10 to 12. So these are segmented. Can we assume that all the other RNA viruses except these four are non-segmented? Perfect. Okay, all the other virus except these, these ones are non-segmented. Okay, so this one over here, if I ask you, if, is it segmented or not segmented? Then what should be your answer? Real virus, fast answers, please, fast answers. Segmented, how many segments are there? 10 to 12 segments, 10 to 12 segments. Okay. Now, real virus, is responsible for causing two things. First of all, real virus, the virus is rotavirus, which falls under real virus. So R for real, R for rota. So rotavirus has 10 to 12 segments. Another an, another lower yield virus is cultivirus. Okay, so cultivirus is responsible for causing Colorado uh, tick fever, but um, it's not very high yield. You will not receive any question from Colorado tick fever. So we will not talk about that. We'll talk about rotavirus in general, okay? So rotavirus, when you think about rota, think about real and think about non-envelope, non double-stranded, segmented, 10 to 12 segments. Okay, next one. Next one is, next one is, I want to talk about uh, picona. Okay, I want to talk about picona virus. Okay. Fast answers, okay. Enveloped or not enveloped? Enveloped or not enveloped? Not enveloped. Very good. Single-stranded or double-stranded? Single stranded, segmented or not segmented, not segmented. Very good. Okay, helical or icosahedral, icosahedral. Okay. Now, picornavirus. The mnemonic for picornavirus is perch, e e r c h, and with perch you have Polio, eco, rhino, coxsackie virus, and hepatitis A. Hepatitis A. Do you guys remember coxsackie A virus? What is coxsackie A virus, uh, rickettsia virus, and secondary syphilis have in common? Cars. Very good. Cars for. Cars for. Palms, very good. Ration, palms and souls. Okay, ration, rash, palm rash. Very good. So that's that. Now I want to talk about some of the viruses very quick. First of all, I want to I want to talk about the fact that um, I want to talk about the fact that over here you have um, you have Coxsackie virus. Okay, Coxsus. Coxsackie virus, Coxsackie virus is one of the most common cause of aseptic meningitis. What do we mean by aseptic meningitis? Aseptic meningitis, basically, we have talked about the fact that what is the most common cause of viral meningitis? Fast answers. Just want to clear some things up. What is the most common cause of viral meningitis? Very good. What is the most common cause of viral encephalitis? 
HSV1. Now, if you if you culture and you find that there's no organism, but there are there's meningitis, meaning that the CSF pressure is very high, okay? Uh, there is lymphocytic infiltrations, but um, very small amount, and then you can, there's no organism which you can culture. Then the organism that you should think about is P. coronavirus, that is Coxsackie virus, okay? Coxsackie virus, and another one, uh, okay, another one is, um, is ecovirus. That's why that's what I remember. Ecovirus and Coxsackie virus. These are the two most common cause of causing aseptic meningitis. This is something which I need you guys to write down in the first day. For your quick revision and recapitulation, I need you guys to write this down because you guys will get questions about this. Write this down over here. Ecovirus, Coxsackie virus for aseptic meningitis. Okay, I need you guys to put some special attention to this one because we all know what polio virus is causing. Polio virus will cause um, polio, right? Uh, fever and uh, fever with paralysis. Rhinovirus is responsible for causing common cold, right? Common cold, sinusitis, and uh, all of those things. So that's that. Okay, and we all know what hepatitis A causes. Hepatitis A, by the name itself, it will cause hepatitis A. That is the hepatitis with fecal oral root transmission. So that's that. But so that so though, that's all for picornavirus. Okay, another one is um, Coxsackie virus, also causes um, hand foot mouth disease. Uh, hand foot mouth disease. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about this in the future, not right now. Okay. Uh, okay, Dr. Allison, thank you so much. Uh, hope you have a great weekend. I'll send you guys the recordings and uh, I'll see you next week. Okay, next one. Next one that I want to talk about is Hep E virus. Thank you for letting me know. You're leaving. Okay, Hep E virus. Hep E virus, is it envelope or not envelope? Fast answers, please. We want to talk about the non, non envelope. Fast answers. Okay, single stranded or double stranded? Fast answers. Single stranded, positive or negative strand? Positive or negative strand? Positive strand. Okay, now um, next one is, uh, next one is uh, over here. That is, uh, is it icosahedral or not icosahedral? Ecosahedral. Okay. Ecosahedral. Next one is hepatitis, hepi virus will cause hepatitis E. Hepatitis e. Okay. We need to discuss hepatitis E in a more detailed manner. Hepatitis E, we all know what hepatitis E is, right? We'll talk about hepatitis viruses as a, in, as a whole later. Okay, but hepatitis. Hep E virus is responsible for causing hepatitis E virus. Next one. Next one is uh, CPRH. So C4, Calci virus. Very good. I made a mistake. Pre previously, I said Corona. It's not Corona. It's Calci. Thank you for correcting me. Now, is it envelope or not envelope? Last answers. Yeah. Calci virus. Envelope or not envelope? Not envelope, very good. Fast answers, I need some fast answers, please. Uh, Single-stranded or, or double-stranded? Single-stranded. Positive or negative? Positive. Okay, icosahedral or, or, or helical? Icosahedral. Calci virus is responsible for causing viral gastroenteritis. Okay, there's a subgroup of Calci virus. This is known as norovirus. Norovirus. This will cause. This will cause viral gastroenteritis. Okay, viral gastroenteritis. Okay. So when you are studying this table at home, do you need to restudy envelope, RNA structure, icosahedral capsid, or can you just go through the medical importance? Which one? Okay, do you realize that if you can only go through the medical importance, the rest of the knowledge is already in your head. Okay, the rest of the knowledge is already in your head. Now let's talk about the ABCD viruses. Okay, so we are done talking about CPRH. Now let's talk about ABCD. 
Okay, first one I'm going to talk about is arena virus. Arena virus, is it envelope or not envelope? Fast answers, please. I want to finish this. Arena virus, it's envelope. Okay. Arena virus is envelope. Then next one is uh, is it single stranded or double stranded? This is single stranded. Okay. Now, I want to talk about um, I want to talk about circular uh, or linear. Okay. I'll I'll write this over here. I'll write this over there. Write it down over here. Circular. Which which RNA viruses are circular? Which one is linear? Do you remember all DNA viruses are linear except which one? All DNAs are linear except very good. So the same thing is all RNAs are linear except A B D. A B D stands for arena virus, bunya virus, delta virus. Circular, circular, circular. Okay, are we clear about this? Yes or no? Did you guys write this down? All are linear except ABD, arena virus, bunya virus, delta virus. So if I ask you right now, is this linear or if this linear or not linear? Is it linear or arena virus? Fast answers. It's a rhetorical question. Of course, it's not linear, as I have just said so. So it's not linear, okay? Is it is it a positive, a positive strand or is it a negative strand? Is it a positive strand or is it a negative strand? Fast answers, please. Okay. Well, basically, according to first day, this, this arena virus, this has both positive and negative. So positive and negative. OK, now, uh, arena virus is responsible for causing uh, Lassa fever and cephalitis and lymphocytic choriomeningitis. That's, that's what's over here. Okay. OK, is it really important to learn about uh, lymphocytic choriomeningitis and Lassa fever and cephalitis? Yes or no? Will you? Is this a very common disease? Right, this is beyond the scope of step one. So no need to learn Lassa fever. Just if they ask you, they can ask you about arena virus regarding these things only. Okay, regarding these things only. Next one, let's talk about Bunya virus. Bunya virus, okay. Is it envelope or not envelope? Envelope. Is it single standard or double standard? Is it positive or negative strand? Okay. Is it helical or icosahedral? Very good, it's helical. Bunya virus, one of the most important Bunya virus that you will get questions from is one question about Hanta virus. Hanta, Hanta virus. Hanta virus is responsible for causing two things. That is, do you, do you guys realize uh, the type of fever which is caused by dengue virus? What is the name of the fever? Is it not hemorrhagic fever? Yes or no? Right? If you have a presentation of dengue virus, like hemorrhagic fever with pneumonia, so it looks like a dengue virus manifestation, but there's pneumonia involved. Think about hantavirus, that is bunya virus, okay? Are we clear? Yes, what is your question, Dr. Osam?
yellow fever is hemorrhagic too. Dengue virus is more, more hemorrhagic, am I correct? If you have a dengue virus, your platelet count decreases to so much that when, whenever you get uh, fever, you have hemorrhages, hemorrhagic manifestations. So what I'm talking about is hantavirus has the same presentation, except there's a combination of severe pneumonia. So that's how I am asking you to identify Bunia viruses in your actual exam. Okay. Uh, and except hunter virus, you also have uh, three other low yield things, which you do not need. Uh, the names of which I truly do not remember. And I think it's not worth remembering. I remember one of the name was Crimean Congo hemorrhage fever. The other two are, let's see, Californian cephalitis and Sandfly Rift Valley fever. These are not high yield. Okay. So you do not have to worry about this. Okay. Are we clear? Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. okay, next one. Next one is uh, coronavirus. Okay. Coronavirus. Okay. Envelope or not envelope? Envelope. But there are some strains which we are talking about right now, nowadays that the coronavirus is a naked virus. That's why I said in the beginning of the lecture that uh, coronaviruses are naked viruses because some new strains of coronavirus have lost their um, envelopes. And since they're naked viruses, they can escape the immune system much faster because of the loss of surface antigen. So with this one, although first aid says it's enveloped, but um, some of them are not enveloped. So, the thing is, this one will need some clarification. So we are going to hold on for this information right now. Okay. Um, did they update the information in 2021? I doubt it. I'm not sure. Okay. Let's talk about single-stranded or double-stranded. Okay. Is it single-stranded or is it double-stranded? Single-stranded. Is it a positive strand or is it a negative strand? Positive strand. Very good. Do you guys remember the? Do you guys remember the mnemonic? I went to a retro toga, right? Toga party where I had flavored Corona. All the positive strand one. So flavored Corona for that one, and uh, flavored for Flavi and Cor and Corona for coronavirus. So it's a positive standard virus. Next one is A B C D, right? So since we are learning this, we can easily say that this is a what type of a what type of a capsid is this? What type of capsid is this? Helical. Helical capsid. Okay, next one. Coronavirus, the famous coronavirus is responsible for causing severe acute respiratory syndrome known as SARS. Also responsible for causing middle, middle Eastern respiratory syndrome or MARS. Or they can also cause common cold. Okay, are we clear about this? Severe acute respiratory syndrome, Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, or common cold. Okay, all right, next one. D4, Delta virus. Okay, Delta virus. Is it enveloped or not enveloped? Envelope. Is it a positive? Is it a single stranded or double stranded? Single stranded. Is it positive or negative stranded? Fast answers, please. Was there the mention of delta in the thing we studied? No. So it's a negative virus. There was no mention of delta in the mnemonic, right? Retro, toga, flavi. There was no delta there, so it's named negative. Next one is. Um, in terms of in terms of capsidity, do you guys remember I said icosahedral or helical? We're not it's uncertain, right? So this one is either icosahedral or helical, uncertain. And delta virus is the famous hepatitis D virus, right? 
what type of uh, viral generic procedure does the hepatitis D virus undergo? Hepatitis D, which we studied before. In, in order to cause the disease, what type of viral genetic procedure does hepatitis D undergo? Complementation. Very good. Okay, so we're done with A, B, C, D. Do we have any virus with E? No. Okay. What was the name of the virus with F? Was it flavivirus? No, it was filovirus. Very good. Okay. Exactly. Okay, it was phylo, not flavi. So don't mix up phylo and flavi. Flavi is equals a hydro. Phylo is phylo is um, helical. Okay. Now let's talk about in terms of um, okay. Let's talk about envelope. Is it enveloped or not enveloped? C P R H are all the non-enveloped. So it's so it's enveloped or not enveloped. It's enveloped. Very good. Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? All RNAs are single-stranded except Rio, which is double-stranded, so it's single-stranded. Is it positive strand or negative strand? I went to a retro toga, right? Over there, F for Flavi, so it's negative strand. And is it is it icosahedral or is it helical? Fast answers, please. Helical, okay. Ilo virus is the most famous virus that is Ebola. Okay. Ebola, does Ebola cause severe hemorrhages and fever? More severe than dengue, right? So this causes hemorrhagic fever. So that's all. That's all for Ebola. Okay, next one. A, B, C, D, E, F, E for nothing, F for phylo. Then we have pro. What was P for? P for? Paramyxo. P4, paramyxo. Okay. Paramyxo, is it um, icosahedral? I mean, is it envelope or not envelope? CPRH is non envelope. So this is enveloped. Very good. Next one is double stranded or single stranded. All RNAs are single stranded except real, which is double stranded. So it's single stranded. Next one is is it positive or negative strand? I went to a retro toga over there. Was there a mention of paramyxo? No, so it's negative. We are still on the discussion of helical, so it's helical capsid. Paramyxo virus is very important because paramyxo virus consists of P, R, and M. P, R, and M, these are basically for para influenza, respiratory syncytial virus, and mums and measles, measles and mums. Para-influenza, not influenza, para-influenza, respiratory syncytial virus. Respiratory syncytial virus is called, responsible for causing bronchiolitis. Para-influenza is, is responsible for causing group. M and M stands for measles and mums. Okay, next one is R. R4. R4. Rio is the wrong answer. Rhabdo. Very good. Rhabdoviridae. Is it enveloped or not enveloped? Enveloped. Single stranded or double stranded? Single stranded. Positive or negative? Negative. Is it helical or not helical? Uh, is which virus is known as the rhabdovirus? Fast answers. This is a bullet shaped virus. Rabies. It's a bullet shaped virus. Okay. Rabies. Okay. Next one. Next one is O, P R O. O4. O4. Orthomyxo. Okay. Is it envelope or not envelope? Envelope. Okay. Is it single stranded or not? Or double stranded? 
single stranded? Is it positive or negative stranded? Negative. Is it helical or icosahedral? Helical. Orthomyxovirus is responsible for one virus only influenza. Okay. Another one is is orthomyxovirus segmented or not segmented? Segmented. How many segments are there? Eight segments. Boarding flight number 382 in 10 to 12 minutes. Okay. Okay. Now, now let's talk about all the leftover viruses. As far as I remember, there was flavivirus. Now, let's talk about flavivirus and put flavivirus under our equation. Is it enveloped or not enveloped? CPRH is not, is not enveloped, so this is enveloped. Is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Single-stranded. Is it positive or negative? Do you guys remember? Flavored pickles. Negative is the wrong answer, so that's positive. Is it, is it segmented or not segmented? Not segmented, very good. Then next one is, is the capsid helical or icosahedral? It's helical, right? Very good, no, okay, good. It's icosahedral, okay. Flavivirus, okay. Flavi virus, okay, is, uh, can you just, just give me one minute, please? Okay, my apologies. Okay, so Flavi virus, the, okay, Flavi virus is high density high density zika west high density zika west high for hepatitis c virus y for yellow fever Den for dengue virus, dense density, dense city or density, ST for St. Louis encephalitis, Zika for Zika virus, West for West Nile virus. Okay, I have a weird way of making um, mnemonics. If you guys can make a better mnemonic than me, then please feel free to do so. Uh, but my mnemonics are the one which I think about in my head. So that's that. Okay, I have a very weird thought, thought pattern. So for me, this works. I'm not sure if it worked work for you or not, but this is uh, the mnemonic that you can use to remember all the flabby viruses. That is hepatitis C, yellow fever, dengue, St. Louis encephalitis, Zika virus, West Nile virus, high density Zika West. Are we clear about this? Yes or no? We'll, we'll obviously talk about these viruses in details, but for now we have to identify the viruses. So that's that. Are we clear? Okay. Did you guys write this down or no? Can I get some responses in the same manner when I ask you whether you guys need a break or not? Okay, perfect. So that's that, okay. So what are the names of the flabby viruses? What are Okay, Dr. Jordan really put some emphasis on the yes. Okay, so thank you. <clears throat> That's um, right. So high density, Zika West. Hepatitis C, yellow fever, ST for St. Louis, dengue, Zika, and West Nile virus. Okay, right. now, next one that I wanna talk about is, okay. Toga, Toga virus, Toga virus. Let's make Toga virus fall into our equation of viruses. First of all, is it envelope or not envelope? Envelope. 
envelope or not envelope? It's envelope. Okay, next one. Next one is, is it single stranded or double stranded? Okay, is it a positive strand or negative strand? Do you remember Toga, which one Toga crew? Retroviral Toga party, right? So positive strand. Is it segmented or not segmented? Not segmented. Okay. Not segmented. Is it helical or icosahedral? It's helical, right? It's icosahedral. Okay, it's icosahedral. Good. Next one. Next one is Toga virus is responsible for one very famous virus. Okay. I saw a lot of students write the name once or twice, waiting for me to say it out loud. The name is chikungunya, okay? Chikungunya virus, responsible for causing severe muscle aches, severe joint pain, and fever. Decreased platelet count, but not hemorrhages. That is chikungunya. The pain, the joint pains and the muscle pain, they are so severe that patients end up having post, um, they end up having post fever, um, uh, pains in the uh, joints and muscles. And along with this, the patients, they also get rashes. Okay. Chikungunya virus, can it happen with a co-infection of dengue virus? Yes. Okay. So chikungunya and dengue can happen together. If it's a dengue virus, can anyone, uh, men can anyone mention the properties of a dengue virus? What, what is the properties of a dengue virus? What are the properties of a dengue virus? Which which virus is, is a dengue virus? Flavivirus, virus, very good. Flavivirus virus is a dengue virus. Yep. So Toga virus can be identified with a name that is crew. Crew C for chikungunya, R for rubella, E for Eastern and Western equine encephalitis. Over here, eastern western equine encephalitis is not very high yield. Chikungunya is very high yield. And rubella is, of course, very high yield. Okay. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about this in the future. But they all fall under Toga virus. If I talk about Coxsackie virus, which type of virus, which type of viral family does Coxsackie virus fall under? Okay. If I talk about... Um, if I talk about measles and mumps, which type of viral family do they fall under? Okay, if I talk about uh, hunter virus, which type of viral family do they fall under? How many segments does hunter virus have? Very good, three segments, okay? okay. If I talk about uh, hepatitis A virus, which viral family do they fall under? P coronavirus, very good. Okay, now, so we're done with Toka virus. Okay, we only have, uh, we only have, I think one more left. Uh, that is retrovirus, the famous retrovirus. What is the first virus that comes to your mind when you hear the word retrovirus? HIV. Yes, that's that's correct. Okay. Envelope. Is it envelope or not envelope? Envelope. Single stranded or double stranded? Single stranded. Is it a positive or a negative strand? Positive strand. Is it linear or circular? Which viruses are, are circular? Which viruses are circular? Arena, Bunya, and Delta virus. Okay. Is it icosahedral or is it helical?
Okay. Um, next one is, next one is uh, the names of the viruses, right? The names of the virus is they have HIV and human T cell lymphotropic virus. These two viruses, they have a very important enzyme. Can anyone name the enzyme? Can anyone name the enzyme? Good. Reverse transcriptase, okay? The name enzyme is reverse transcriptase. Okay, so with that being said, I guess we have covered almost everything from that table, okay? So let's go and see if we have covered everything from that table or not. The thing is you guys, do you guys realize that you guys completed the table by yourself? Except we, I did not do much, much like anyways, you guys completed the whole thing by yourself. All I did was I asked you whether it's envelope or not envelope, okay? I know a lot of students personally, they have a lot of issues understanding and memorizing all of this information over here, but have we understood all of this information? Yes or no? Okay, so before and after the lecture, do you see a huge difference in your understanding of the viruses and how I told you I'll, we'll, I'll try to make it as easy as possible? Okay, can you, rep uh, can, you, can you repeat the mnemonic of flavivirus? Yes, uh, the mnemonic for flavivirus is high density Zika West. High density Zika West for HCV, yellow fever, dengue, density ST for St. Louis, West, Zika West. Zika for Zika, West for West, Nile virus. Can you explain the importance of arena virus? Arena virus, there is no importance, very little importance because it's responsible for causing Lassa fever and cephalitis and lymphocytic choreomeningitis. Both of the diseases are not talked about, nor have I or any of our students received any questions from these ones. So you can uh, skip this out if you want to. Okay. Are we clear about RNA viruses? Guys, I need some feedbacks. How do you guys feel? in terms of your confidence of understanding the table. Is there a difference between your understanding of the table now and before the lecture? Yes, okay. Um, okay, so can we take a small break for five minutes and then let's come back and finish this? Okay, this is, this is exactly what I'm talking about. Do you guys see the response time? Okay, for when I, when I ask you, can we take a small break? Okay, whenever I mention the word break, the response time, okay, the response time is 0 0.5 nanosecond. Whenever I ask, have you guys understood this? Is the, the response time is two hours, okay? Okay, so with that being said, um, so with that being said, let's take the break for five minutes and then let's come back, okay? It's 12.28 as of right now, we'll start the lecture again at 12.32. Uh, then we will come back and we will finish. Antigenic ship drift is there. Measle mums, ladies, Ebola, hepatitis. We'll try to finish as much as possible. Okay, so let's take that break for five to 10 minutes. Let's come back.
Okay, so can you guys hear my voice? Is everyone back? Okay, perfect. So Dr. Iman is back. Is everyone is anyone else back from their break so that we can begin? Okay. Now let's start. Let's start with this page over here. This page will get finished relatively very fast because we have discussed all the high yield things. So now, first of all, is negative strand viruses. Negative strand viruses. First of all, let's talk about how you can identify the negative strand viruses. All the viruses which does not fall under the mnemonic of retroviral toga party and hippie calci pickle. Can we assume that all those all the other viruses are negative strand viruses? Yes. Okay, so you do not need to memorize. You do not need to memorize this mnemonic. Okay. You do not need to memorize this mnemonic, so don't worry about this. Just remember that negative strand viruses must transcribe negative strand to positive strand first. So they need their own RNA dependent RNA polymer RNA dependent RNA polymerases. So these viruses, they will cause infections for sure, but their infection time will be more because they need, they need to transcribe from the negative to positive first, and then the positive will multiply. Okay, so are we clear about this? Yes or no? Okay. Next one is segmented virus. Do we need to do we need to learn about about this again? We already learned, right? Boarding 382 in 10, 12 minutes. So these are all RNA viruses. We already talked about this, so we can skip this out. Let's go to picornavirus. First of all, can anyone tell me the mnemonic for picornavirus? What is the mnemonic for picornavirus? Mnemonic perch. Very good. So can anyone name the uh, all five picornavirus? Polio, very good. Eco, R4, Rhino, C4, Cox, Fecky, and H4. H4, which hepatitis is this? H4 what? Hepatitis A virus. Hepatitis A virus, all of these viruses, these viruses, they are all enterovirus, okay? All of these viruses are enteroviruses, except rhinovirus and hepatitis A virus. In USMD step one, for aseptic meningitis, aseptic meningitis, they can mention either they can mention Coxsackie virus, either they can mention ecovirus, or they can mention enterovirus. Whichever they mention, just try to remember they're trying to mention picorna. They will never mention picorna. Maybe in NDME, they might mention picorna at least once, <clears throat> but they will mention Coxsackie, eco, or enterovirus. So that's that. Okay. Now, these are all uh, polio, eco, and rhino, Coxsackie and HAV. The RNA is translated into one large polypeptide that is cleaved by viral proteases into functional viral proteins. So there's a one large protein chain that is broken down into smaller chains. And all, all, and all of these viruses, except rhino and HAV, is responsible for causing aseptic meningitis. Okay, uh, uh, so do not forget this. It's HAV, not enterovirus. It's not an enterovirus. All are enteroviruses except rhinoviruses and HAV. Okay. Are we clear? It, it's, it says over here look, all are enteroviruses except rhinovirus and HAV virus. Okay. Now, rhinovirus. Rhinovirus, first of all, it's a picornavirus we just read. It, this is the most common cause of common cold, and there are hundreds of serological types of this virus. The fact that there are hundreds of serological types, please underline this. Okay, because a uh, more than 100 serological type, this is important for your NDME. Okay, they are all acid labile, meaning that if they're ingested, they will not cause um, the disease because they will be destroyed by the stomach acid. Therefore, they will not inf infect the GI tract. They are responsible for causing runny nose, sinusitis, right? Upper respiratory tract infections, and all those things. Okay, next one is yellow fever. Mm -hmm. Which viral family does yellow fever belong to? Flavivirus. 
what are the names of all the other flaviviruses? What was the mnemonic we used for flavivirus? High density Zika West, very good. I can't see the screen. Can everyone see the screen? Can, can you guys see the screen? Okay. Okay, Dr. Sabir Khatun, I'm pretty sure there's something wrong with um, your Zoom application. If you want, you can restart it and come back. I'll, I'll, I'll let you come back in. Okay, so high density Zika West with that, we have hepatitis C, yellow fever, dengue, ST, St. Louis encephalitis, then Zika and West Nile and West Nile encephalitis. So yellow fever is a flavivirus that is transmitted by Aedes mosquito, Aedes mosquito. The virus has a monkey or human reservoir. The symptoms are there's high fever, black vomit and jaundice. So high fever, black vomiting, and you will have jaundice, okay? You, they may see councilman bodies. Councilman bodies, you guys remember we talked about councilman bodies before on uh, Gaston GI system, that councilman bodies are seen on liver biopsy, which shows acute, acute um, liver damage. Yes or no? Do you guys remember we talked about this? Acute liver damage. You, right? These are eosinophilic, these are eosinophilic apoptotic globules. Yes, it's seen in alcoholic hepatitis too. So acute liver damage. If you find a patient with eosinophilic apoptotic globules on the liver, you can uh, you can conclude that the, these are councilman bodies. Okay. Okay, you can come back no problem. Now, the virus of the hour. Okay. Rota virus. Rotavirus, which family do they belong to? Rotavirus. Rheovirus. Are they segmented or not segmented? Segmented. How many segments are there? Ten to twelve segments. Rotavirus, is it single stranded or double stranded? because all RNA viruses are single-stranded except Rio virus, which is double-stranded. This is the most important global cause of infantile gastroenteritis, okay? This causes gastroenteritis in uh, young infants. It causes acute diarrhea, especially during winter and daycare centers, okay? I need you guys to focus on this one, daycare centers and kindergartens, because in step one, they will use daycare centers and kindergartens in the question stem to make questions about rotavirus. I can make questions about rotavirus. So daycare centers, which virus is more predominant in daycare centers in US? That is rotavirus, okay? So you will have multiple questions where they will tell you that after the, uh, after the parents picked up the child from the daycare centers, the child came back home with acute abdominal pain and watery diarrhea, the uh, virus is rotavirus. Rotavirus, the way they cause their uh, disease is that they prevent absorption of sodium and uh, and what happens is when they prevent absorption of sodium, it's an osmotically active substance which pulls in more water into the gut lumen. And as a result, this causes massive voluminous watery diarrhea and there's also loss of potassium with it. The way they, they decrease the absorption of sodium is they prevent the uh, intestinal villi from working properly. So they cause villus destruction with atrophy, they cause they cause atrophic villi. So if if you do a if you do a GI biopsy on a patient with rotavirus, then you can see that over there there is villus destruction with atrophy. Uh, CDC, meaning the Center for Disease Control, does it cause intestinal obstruction? Also, yes. Do you remember we talked about this intestinal obstruction? Because rotavirus, what they will do is they will increase the um, they will they will inf they will increase the, the lymph nodes, right? The GI lymph nodes, uh, especially the ones that, that are Pears, Pears patches, okay? They will inflame them and they will increase and that will be a, an area for intestinal obstruction. So that's also one of the cases. Rotavirus can also cause intestinal obstruction. CDC is Center for Disease Control. They recommend routine vaccination of all infants except those with a history of SCID. What is SCID? 
Well, what is kid? What is kid? Severe combined immunodeficiency. Okay. Skid. Uh, what are the causes, two causes of skid? What are the two causes of skid? Adenosine deaminase and IL2R. Very good. Which one is more common? Adenosine deaminase or IL2R? IL2R. Very good. Okay. Now, can we give live vaccines to patients of skid? Okay. Is rotavirus a live vaccine? Is rotavirus a live vaccine? Forgot. Okay. What are what are the names of the live vaccines? Okay. Can anyone go to the page of the vaccines? Okay, no problem, you you forgot, okay, no problem. I need you guys to revise this right now. Uh, it will take only take 10 seconds or 20 seconds. All you have to do is go to the page of the vaccines and learn the names by the mnemonic of the live vaccines and the killed vaccines. Okay, if you are done, write down you're done and I'll ask you. Very good, attention teachers, there we go. So we have Dr. Jordan, attention teachers, please vaccinate young infants with MMR regularly. Do you remember that one? Okay, I need you guys to read that for one, for at least one minute and just let me know. Right. Okay. Can anyone mention the two mnemonics absolutely confidently? Once again, please, so, so that we can move on. Yes, Dr. Jordan, if you want, you can use the chat box or you can unmute yourself, whichever you prefer. Name the mnemonic mm -hmm. for live vaccines and for so, Okay. If I remember, um, for live, um, live attenuated, we had a uh, Attention teachers, um, please vaccinate beautiful, uh, young, small infants with MMR. Okay. MMR. So that's for live vaccines. Yeah. And over yeah. there, can yeah. you mention the names of the live vaccines? Yes. So for attention, for A, we have adenovirus. For um, t teachers, we have typhoid. Uh, okay. For please, we have, um, if I'm not mistaken, polio. Polio, and, yes. Uh, and for vaccinate, we have varicella. Okay. For small, we have small box. For beautiful, okay. we have BCG. Okay. For young, we have yellow fever. For infants, we have influenza. And MMR is MMR. And I think we have rota, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, no problem. And, and uh, what about the killed vaccines? Uh, okay. For the kill, um, it's a trip could kill you. Mm -hmm. So... A is for Hep A. Okay. Trip is trip is for typhoid. Okay. Um, could there was nothing for could I guess and yeah. could kill you is polio sac. Okay. And um, do you remember that um, there, there there was another one which I which which I used that was RIP always that's another easy one that's rabies influenza polio and hepatitis A, but MMR MMR over there R is for rotavirus. Okay, okay. okay. The RSV okay. rotavirus. So rotavirus is a live vaccines. So thank you so much, Dr. Jordan, for mentioning all the live vaccines. And with that, can everyone please try to remember the names of the live and the killed vaccines because they are extremely important. And that's why I put some emphasis on learning it right away because you will be asked about this, okay? And you will have to provide the right answer, okay? Are we clear about this, yes or no? So now, can we give rotavirus, which is a live vaccine, to a patient with skid? That was the main thing. 
to be focused on. No. Okay, so an another reason for knowing the names of the live vaccines is so that you can prevent the you can prevent the prescription or prescribing. You, you can pre prevent prescribing live vaccines to patients of skid or any other immunodeficiency diseases, basically. Okay, now, influenza. Let's talk about influenza virus. First of all, influenza is an orthomyxovirus. If, if it's an orthomyxovirus, is it enveloped or not enveloped? Fast answers, please. Once again, we're doing it once again. Orthomyxo, enveloped or not enveloped? Enveloped, is it single-stranded or double-stranded? Single stranded, positive or negative? Negative. Negative. Right, that is negative. Yes, you are correct. Okay, now linear or circular? Linear. Segmented or not segmented? Segmented. How many segments? Eight segments. Okay. He uh, helical or icosahedral? Here we go. So it's an envelope, negative, single-stranded, with eight segment. It contains, okay, influenza virus. It contains hemagglutinin or neuroaminidase. Hemagglutinin or neuroaminidase. Hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase, these are high-yield antigens that is responsible for either mounting a proper immune response or for forming vaccines. So basically, um, Hemagglutinin will bind to sialic acid and they will allow the entry of the virus into the organism and neuroaminidase will promote variant release. This is very, very commonly tested. What is the function of hemagglutinin and what is the function of neuroaminidase? Hemagglutinin will allow the virus will allow the virus to entry by binding with the cell surface receptor, sialic acid, and neuroaminidase will allow the variant to be released. So release of the variant. One is for release, one is for binding. Heme binding and new neuroaminidase will help in release. Do not forget this. Patients at risk for fatal bacterial superinfection, if they get an influenza virus, do you guys remember we talked about this when we were re when we were reading staph staph aureus that the secondary cause of bacterial pneumonia, staph aureus is one of the most secondary cause of uh, bacterial pneumonia. If a patient previously was attacked with hemophilus, uh, if, I'm sorry, if a, patient, if a patient was previously attacked with influenza virus, the next secondary cause for pneumonia is um, staph aureus or streptococcus pneumonia or hemophilus influenza. Okay, uh, this is also a question, that's why. Now, reformulated vaccines contains viral strains most likely to appear during the flu season due to the virus rapid genetic change, okay? The virus changes very quickly because do you realize that since it's a segmented virus, there's a possibility for genetic reassortment to happen very quickly? Yes or no? We talked about this. Yes, okay. So killed viral vaccine is most frequently used. Live vaccines contains temperature sensitive mutant that replicates in the nose, but not in the lungs. So it's administered intranasally. So we give this intranasally. Why do we give it intranasally? Because we want to prevent the virus to cause the damage in the lungs by uh, reverting to its pathogenic form and causing viral pneumonia. Treatment is supportive, or you can give Tamiflu. This is Tamiflu. Tamiflu is oseltamivir or zinamivir. US Family Step 1 U World has the tendency of using this um, brand name for neuroaminidase inhibitors, that is Tamiflu, and they ask the mechanism of action. Write, write this down, write down Tamiflu over here. This is Oseltamavir and Zinamavir. Okay, are we clear? Okay. Now, we'll talk about antigenic shift and we'll talk about antigenic drift. Okay, antigenic shift and drift, they, these are basically nothing. First of all, let's talk about antigenic shift and let's talk about drift. Let's talk about antigenic shift first. Antigenic shift is, is the type of antigenic change that occurs as a result of antigenic shift is the type of antigenic problem that happens due to viral reassortment. Okay, if there's a reassortment of the segmented viruses, for example, there's a segmentation of the influenza virus 
uh, with, for example, human flu virus, which is influenza, can get reassorted with the swine flu virus, right? And this can result in a new sort of viral strain. The same thing that happened for coronavirus, although coronavirus is not that very segmented, but viral reassortment did happen, okay? But it's more common for segmented virus and this can result in what we call is a pandemic. Okay, and antigenic drift. Antigenic drift is very minor changes. Antigenic drift are not viral reassortment. Do you guys remember we just talked about hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase, yes or no? Yes, okay. If I tell you that hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase, if they keep on changing, will you have a proper immune response to a single type of the virus? No. So antigenic drift are minor changes. These are minor change, these are major change. Major change. These are minor changes. Where does the change happen in antigenic drift? The change happens in hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase. As a result, you have, as a result, you have epidemics, not pandemic. Okay, are we clear? Are we clear about this? Yes or no? Question. Yes. What is your question? You can uh, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Yes, of course. Uh, doctor, about the influenza vaccine, which one we give uh, um, intranasally? Influenza vaccine, we give the live one inter intranasally. Live okay. vaccine. Okay, we give live vaccine intranasally. Okay. Anyone else have any question or have you understood antigenic shift and anti antigenic shift? Has everyone understood antigenic shift and antigenic drift? Perhaps that's it, please. Okay. Once again, response time is going down. Okay, do you, do you guys need another break? No more break, okay. Okay. Once again, can we move forward? Okay, do you guys want to uh, end the lecture here after this one? After reading about rubella and paramesovirus from this page? Can I get some fast feedbacks, please? Okay, so since everyone is saying yes, that's what we're going to do. Uh, I personally wanted to go a little bit further, but uh, taking into consideration that it's a Friday and you guys need some breaks, so that's what we're going to do. So antigenic shift, once again, is infection of one cell by two different segmented virus, one from a human, another from another species. As a result, segmented reassortment happens and there's a new virus which results in a pandemic. And antigenic drift are minor changes in hemagglutinin or neuroaminidase, this response from local outbreaks or epidemics. That's that. Okay, so as you can see over here, virus A and virus B together, genetic reassortment, antigenic shift this is a new strain, pandemic. This is an old strain with only a change in hemagglutinin and neuroaminidase, and this results in epidemics. Okay. Okay, how about we study? rubella and paramyxo virus from next class, Monday. Okay, because these are comparatively very high yield, so I do not want to, um, I do not want to rush over them. Okay, are we clear? Okay, so next week we will finish microbiology for sure, and we will start with, which one do you guys want to start? Do you guys want to start pharma or pathology, which one? Can we get some feedbacks? Pharma or pathology? Both of them are extremely high yield. And we have prepared a lot of mnemonics and a lot of things to make pathology easy. Do you guys, do you guys remember seeing a lot of uh, tables on pathology, which a lot of students find difficult? Right? Yes. Very little. Yes. The first batch of students, 
our classes with you are almost over. Okay. Uh, let's see who the students are. Okay. As far as I as far as I remember, I have Dr. Adenom, Dr. Dalia, Dr. Ms. Dr. Hossam, Dr. Jordan, Dr. Kameshwari, Dr. Lala, Dr. Mudla, Dr. Naud, Dr. Nikki, and a lot of other students who will be watching the video later. Our classes with you are almost coming to an end. We have uh, supposedly two more weeks, I assume, two to three more weeks, not three weeks, two, two weeks or something like this. So that's that so thank you so much for sticking with us for so long and for the rest of the students that means our new session will begin very quick from where we will discuss cardiovascular system again once again yes two weeks not more than two weeks um so um our, our new session will begin very soon in two weeks that is cardiovascular system would once start and we will go about all the systems one by one cardiovascular endocrine and that's what we're going to do with the new batch so with that being said, thank you so much for sticking with us for so long. Uh, we are going to end the lecture over here for today and for this week. And uh, I need you guys to memorize the information we read from microbiology. And um, I need you guys to, um, I need you guys to um, start doing a little bit of the question. Now you guys are ready. You guys have studied most of the microbiology. So if you guys want, you guys are more than welcome to start a little bit of microbiology from the U world. Uh, from to, uh, today or tomorrow. And um, after we are done next week, you guys can pull, uh, you guys can start the questions uh, full head on. So that's what it is. We also have a little portion of the ending of ethics. Yes, we also have a little portion of the ethical portion that we, we will cover everything in two weeks and uh, pharma and pathology will not take a lot of time. We also need to cover the CT scan. Do you guys remember the CT scan? The CT scan class is still there. Okay, the city scan class still needs to happen, and uh, there will all there will also be another one, another class that is the last class of the first batch, will be in in two weeks, most probably the Friday after this two weeks, where we will uh, say our goodbyes and we will tell you exactly how you can enter your dedicated period if you are ready or not ready. Uh, whatever you need to know, we will tell you. And at the same time, we just also want to let you know that even though our lectures with you are coming to an end, that's that doesn't mean that you guys do not have access to our lectures. So what would happen is in the future, uh, when we would be taking our lecture once again, if you want, you can join the lectures again, obviously for free. You guys do not have to make um, the transactions to join the lectures. This is only for the first batch of students. Um, for example, if uh, we will be letting you not, uh, know that um, we would be doing those lectures again. So yes, you are more than welcome to join those lectures, from, uh, considering if you were there for the first time, then obviously you will be joining that lecture, okay? And you guys will also have me right by your side when you prepare for step one, every step of the way, I will try to make sure that I can provide you with um, all the help and information. So what we will be doing is after we are done with the first batch of students, we will be opening a WhatsApp group where I will be accessible um, 24 hours of the day. I'll try to make sure if you guys have any questions, you guys get rapid replies, especially from me, not from any one of my team members. Okay, because a lot of our team members, they are um, they're, they're actually pretty juniors and um, they work uh it's a, it's a part-time job so it takes some time for them to reply and um, that's that so um in order to give you a faster reply i'll try to make sure that there's a whatsapp group and um over there i'll try to make sure that um i, I give a more faster reply to you guys when you guys are preparing for your step one um that is during your dedicated period. Okay. So with that being said, thank you so much for doing the lecture here. I'm going to stop the lecture at, over here and start from over here on Monday. Hope you guys have a great week. Uh, I mean, hope you guys have a great weekend. Make sure to have fun. Do not study at least one day of the weekend. Do whatever you have to do. Watch a movie. Go outside with your friends and family. Okay. And uh, clear your mind because so the after in the next two weeks, we will be finishing first aid for sure. Okay. So thank you. And once again, have a great day.
I'll see you guys next week, Monday. If you guys have any questions, please send us an email. If you guys have any feedbacks for us, we would highly, highly appreciate your feedback because we try to work as hard as possible to make sure that you guys learn everything. Uh, and at the same time, we would also be needing some help from you and said in terms of reviews, because a lot of students, they will join the lecture seeing your reviews. So that's it. So we would highly, highly appreciate any review and feedback. So thank you so much once again. Have a great day. I'll see you guys on Monday. Bye-bye.